Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. This episode of the podcast is with the groundbreaking and entertaining and charming cosmologist and particle physicist, Andre Linde at Stanford University. Andre is one of the leaders and founders uh, or developers of the modern theory of inflation, the best theory for understanding the beginning of the universe. And we had a comprehensive and delightful discussion of his own background, which is fascinating. Andre grew up in Moscow. His parents were both professors at Moscow State University. We talked about those experiences growing up from just after the war. He was born in 1948, through the period of the Cold War, and through the period of the 80s when he was in the Soviet Union, uh, about his experiences developing the theory of inflation, uh, both internally within Russia and interacting with the outside world, and then and then his experiences since. All of that was woven into a discussion of the theory of inflation, and particularly the theory of eternal chaotic inflation and the multiverse. So the podcast and the discussion provides a wealth of information, both on the sociology of science and an understanding of modern cosmology. I really hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. And I really thank Andre for taking the time out to to devote such a comprehensive discussion uh, uh, on his ideas with me. You can watch the whole thing, of course, without advertisements on our Substack site, Critical Mass, or you can watch it later on on our YouTube channel, or you can listen to it anywhere Bonner Podcast can be listened to. Either way, no matter how you listen to it or watch it, I think you'll find this a fascinating dialogue, and I hope you enjoy it with Andre Linde. Thanks. Well, Andre, I can't tell you how happy I am that you uh, that you're here. It's been a long time that I wanted to talk to you on the podcast. I've enjoyed talking to you for at least thirty years, and and uh, every time it's fun and I learn something. And and I also you usually tell me I'm wrong one way or another. So I'm sure that'll happen today. Well, I'm not so sure, and I'm not so dumb. Uh, how to say criticizing? I'm a little. Oh, really? maybe, maybe you're mellowing as you get older. And if I understand it was your 75th birthday recently. Happy birthday. Thank you. You look you're, you, you look great. And soon, as I told you when we emailed, I'll soon I'll be in that same decade. But and, and, and we'll share that. Um, Don't rush. <laughs> OK, yeah, I'll try and delay it as long as long as possible. Um, it, as should be clear to anyone, anyone who knows anything about you, and if not, the people who listen to this, what I've always enjoyed uh, from you is is that you are, in my mind, one of the most imaginative and fun cosmologists I've known in the entire time I've known cosmologists, and and um, and constantly kind of reinventing new ideas, which is which is is just remarkable. Often ideas that it takes a lot of other. I know in my own case, ideas that when I first heard them, I went ah, and then and then when you think about them. They get more and more uh, convincing. It's really kind of interesting how the things you have suggested. Um, ha- at first, bec- it took a number of cases. It took a long time for people to to think they weren't crazy. And uh, and and what? Well, thanks, but that's true for you as well. <laughs> well, look, I want to, as you know, this uh, this is an origins podcast, and I like to learn about the origins of people. Uh, mm-hmm. the people that I'm interested in. And it gives me a chance to ask you questions, about, which I've never gotten to ask you in all the time I've known you, which is really about your life. So I want to I want to talk about that. And, we'll, and weaving your life history will allow us, I think, to to weave in the science, which will be. So I think the two will work together in many people's cases. I don't think that's the case. But in yours, they go hand in hand. You were born in Moscow in 1948. When, and I first thought about that. That was just after World War II, and Russia yeah. must have been, in, oh, then the Soviet Union, in incredible straits uh, after after having suffered by during the World War II because of the Nazi invasion. Do you remember when you were younger? Did you any sense that that there were scarcity, or do you, do you remember anything, or was it just? Life was normal because, for as a kid, whatever you grow up with, it seems seems normal. Well, uh, I do not remember richness, 
but I also do not remember uh, scarcity. Maybe, you know, kids are less sensitive to it because they do not know what to compare it with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you have fun even if you're finding sticks or stones in the backyard. It's You can always make make games and and but what what i hadn't known uh, and, and i should have was that both of your parents were professors of physics yeah uh my mom studied uh, cosmic rays and my father was in a radio physicist uh, radi yeah, radiation physics they were both at moscow state university as professors uh, no uh, my father was a professor in a different place uh, oh. as a um, yeah, Radio Technical Institute, whatever. But my mother was a professor at M Moscow State University. We'll get there. Was she a professor when you were a student? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, but I never attended. Never took any courses from her? No. Okay. No. Course, course course. Course. So, okay. It was not something which, uh, well, I was eager to know much except for I read her book on uh, nuclear physics. Uh, so it, it was uh, certainly contact, but mostly it was just intellectual environment, I would say. Their friends were coming to our house. Yeah, uh, no, we'll get there. I want to talk, but I find this fascinating for so many reasons. Not least, uh, so they must have been, if they were professors, that were they professors throughout the, the war? I mean, have you talked to them throughout the war? No. no. Uh, they were students at the beginning of the war. And uh, my father was just taken from Moscow State University and, uh, well, uh, sent somewhere to learn radio physics as an application, whatever. And my mother decided to, well, to go fight. So she was actually a military pilot. She was the chief of staff of the division of night bombers. <laughs> She, she was a Can pilot. You imagine this. Now tell me about me being so <laughs> scary. No. Okay. Now, uh, it was just a division of uh, women who wanted to prove that they also can fight with Germans. And uh, they decided to do it somehow. And they organized a division which was purely women. Okay. Wow. So just on, only once. Uh, during the war, some men who is well was supposed to help them with radio or whatever um, became a part of this division. But few uh, days later, when they gave him well his bra, <laughs> <laughs> he disappeared. <laughs> he could have identified as a woman, but we won't get there right now. I don't want to get to that. But they were pretty successful in what they were doing they were uh, flying only on night on very light airplanes and and but she was actually a pilot she she was well she mean uh, uh she she was flying but not often she was the chief of staff of the division ah, uh, because okay. she was from the university they decided that we must use her like an intellectual force and that's how it was and after okay. the, the but, war, she had written a book about this and what, whatever. Yeah. But did but did she have a pilot's license? Did she ever fly afterwards or no? I don't know whether uh, they uh, had a licenses for that, but surely she was flying. Yes. Wow. But she never took you up in the air in the air afterwards when you were younger. Well, no, she didn't. Yeah. Now, but still, th this begs a bunch of a whole bunch of questions. Not not only that, just that she was in this amazing regiment but she must have studied physics how maybe it was it in 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 the soviet union it wasn't that unusual for women to study science back then or was she very unique um well i do not know statistics of that time but i know uh, lots of her women friends uh, who studied with her oh. uh, only one or two uh, which were not her friends at that time uh, well, uh, left Moscow University at the beginning of the war and went uh, went to front. Uh, but uh, there are quite a few uh, people whom I have seen later. In fact, this uh, they were studying physics at Moscow University in the same year in the similar groups with Andrei Sakharov, who's wow. now you know. Yeah, so of course. usually 
when she would say, oh, Andrei said so, and sometimes she meant me, sometimes she meant Sakharov. <laughs> did, it, wow, okay. So she, did, she went back to school after the war, but, but she was a professor by 19, when you were already born, right? So she must have no, graduated. No, uh, no, no, she, she became a professor much later because she oh. was a student at the beginning of the war. And so she was she, a student when you were born? Uh, yeah, uh, and after that, she well, uh, yeah. got her PhD and stuff, and uh, well, long story. Did yeah. you, yeah, there's lots of, anyway, well, well, I might ask some more things, but I find this fascinating. Did you, so she was a student same time as Sakharov. Did you ever meet Sakharov? <laughs> Many times. I, I, uh, I was visiting him in Gorky when he was in exile. He oh. was a, a part of our uh, Liberty Physical Institute theory and group. Okay, and when his, you were there. Uh, second name, uh, you know, my name is Andrei Dmitrievich Linde. Dmitrievich yeah. means the name of my father, ah. Dmitri. Okay, and he was also Andrei Dmitrievich. Oh, so it was this funny story among uh, well, uh, somebody from our Liberty Institute saying that if you go along the corridor of our institute and you see uh, two Andrei Dmitrievich. This means you're drunk, okay. <laughs> but the reality is that, well, yeah, uh, uh, for authorities of our institute, one Andrei Dmitrich, and I mean Sakharov, was already too much. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we are trying to help him to survive during this time. Because really? he was under the pressure, and our group, because of that, was under the pressure. Because we were supposed to, like, for example, if you want to go abroad, okay, mm -hmm. you must admit that Sakharov is anti soviet -chic. And okay, oh. uh, what does it mean? This means that the enemy of Soviet Union. And uh -huh. what the, in, in simple terms, that he is an enemy of people. And so if you want to go abroad, oh, okay. So this, I, I, I even remember how it was in my case, and that was really ridiculous. But okay, it's a long story. If I wish, if you if I can tell you about this, eventually I did not say that. Okay, but it was, um, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to go to U.S. Well, we'll get there. We get. I was going to ask about the reasons you decided to go to the U.S. And I mean, there were presumably a lot, but I wanted. I want to get there. That's a while away from where we'll start. But it must have. <laughs> that's one of the. In retrospect. You know, I actually, by the way, the first time I visited the Soviet Union, believe it or not, was 1967. Oh. Uh, in the 50th anniversary of the revolution. I was there when I was 13 years old. It was a re it was a, like a different world for me. But one mm. thing I learned at the time, and I also learned it even when I was a student and, and Soviet <laughs> scientists periodically would come visit when I was at MIT. Um, uh, there were some well-known Soviet scientists who were sufficiently well integrated into the Communist Party that they were allowed to travel frequently. Um, uh, uh, Fideyev, I think, for example. But um, uh, I learned then that that it, the, the ability of Russians to say what whatever was necessary, knowing they didn't believe it, but you know, knowing that the official line that they were required to adhere to was nonsense, and they just did it, but but everyone realized it was nonsense. And and, and, uh, I think it depends. Uh, among my friends, uh, uh, nobody did it. Um, well, you know, the reason I'm I'm thinking about that is that there's a there are there's a trend in universities now which I've criticized to require people to require young faculty and students to make claims about things like diversity that that, that and their and their adherence to th these certain principles that. They may or may not agree to, but everyone has to do it to become a, a member of the faculty. And it reminded me of Russia when, when, when it was younger that everyone had to make these claims that Sakharov was an enemy of the state, even though they didn't believe it. But in order to get a position, they had to. Um, well, uh, I would not compare it yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you wouldn't. Okay, it's funny because I have some friends. One of mine is a uh, she's a Russian a, a chemist at US, at uh, USC who was who was educated in Russia, and she said there's she might. She often rem talks to me about, in her mind, the similarities, but but maybe you don't feel them so much. Well, uh, I mean, uh, I was uh, this Liberty Physical Institute 
uh, it was like a small island ah, we were surrounded by a big institute. So okay. the big institute had a party committee, whatever, uh -huh. and we were uh, more or less a small, <clears throat> well, small. We were quite <clears throat> quite a large organization, uh, theory division. There was about maybe uh, 30 professors. But um, we were able to, okay, I, I can tell you what Ginsburg said okay. <clears throat> about that time. And you know, Academic Ginsburg, of course, he, uh, Nobel laureate later, later uh, he was one of the inventors of theory of superconductivity, and he did not mince words. So when he said, and a long time, uh, well, after already all of these times when Sakharov was let go back to Moscow, etc., he was talking at our, well, uh, professor's meeting, saying something like that. And we went through a different, difficult time. And during this time, we had a success so that there is no, and then he said something in Russian, well, mm -hmm. swolach, did, did no swolach in our theory division during this time, which was quite an achievement. Oh, okay. That is how. Okay, well, that's great. I mean, but but before you, we get to your own time in Levin, uh, the institute, I want to go back in time for you. Still, with, your, with both your parents being scientists, was it assumed that you would be that you or what that you'd go into science? I know you were interested in geology. We'll get to there. But what got you? Was it assumed you would be interested in science, or or did you get interested just simply because of, of the atmosphere in which you grew up in, or or your reading? Did you ever think of doing anything other than science or, or uh, did your parents encourage anything or did they just encourage you to do whatever you wanted? My childhood, I did not think about <clears throat> becoming a scientist. It all started for me quite spontaneous when I was in the fifth grade. I suddenly got interested in geology and that was it. And what, what got you interested in geology though? Oh, well, uh, these precious minerals, travel and everything. I was well walking uh, in the wilderness with a big backsack, and to make this more difficult, I put the stones in my backsack so it would be stronger, <laughs> whatever. Um, oh, so, interesting. Yeah, so that explains it. Right? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. But, and so your parents didn't say, "Oh, don't be a geologist, be a physicist." They 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 were happy with whatever you did. They never. Gave... Well, they, they did uh, uh, something which was much more clever. They uh, brought, uh, because there were two of them uh, professors, they managed to buy a car. Okay. And they uh, traveled on this car with me on the back seat from Moscow to, of all places, to Crimea, mm -hmm. which was at that time. <laughs> yeah, you could yes. do that. Okay. Uh, and this was a very, very, very long drive. Mm -hmm. So I was in the back seat, and they gave me uh, two books. I was at that time just graduated from seventh grade uh, school, and they gave me two books to read. Uh, the first one was about astrophysics, and the second one was special theory of relativity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just. Uh, <laughs> It's Past a nice time. thing to give a say, someone in seventh because, grade. You'd have because to, uh, I kind of isolated, cannot do anything at all. Yeah. And yeah. this is an entertainment. And when uh, I finished, when we arrived, and it was like a week, when we arrived in Crimea, I felt horrible. Because, you know, my only climb to fame uh, in my school was already in the fifth grade, I already fifth grade, I already know my future profession, a geologist. Oh. And now and now I am not a geologist anymore because this is so much more interesting. But now I must come to school and say, boys, I am a traitor. <laughs> I, okay, and so I did. Because well, I, now, that explains it because I was reading your, a, a biography of you and you said it, you be, felt like a traitor when you decided not to do geology. And I thought, why would you feel like a traitor? Your parents were physicists. Because it's the love of my life, geology. Yeah, you, yeah. You, know, you, you just, well. Huh. Yeah, now I understand it. Now, let me, you we, you have a brother. Do you have any, you have a brother who's a psychologist? Is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Is it just the two of you? Yeah. Okay. Was he in the back seat too? No. He was older than you, or he, he is three years younger. Younger. He didn't so, come. Well, yeah. No, he oh. didn't come. So he might have been a kind of physicist if he'd been able to read those books too. Then maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It's just you know, it's, it's selective enjoyment. You know. Yes. Yeah. Now they kind of knew you would probably enjoy the books, but one thing I was going to ask you: they're probably Russian books, but were any of them books by any scientist I would know, or or not? The the the. the, the... Uh, the uh, short book uh, was by Landau and some and somebody. Oh, Landau, by Landau, of course. But this was a popular book. Okay, yeah, so I didn't know. realize Landau wrote popular books. That's wonderful. Well, um, and another one, Astra, it was just a popular book. Yeah, yeah. But Don't say just a popular reason. book. As you know, I like popular books. I write them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, I think... This because it changes uh, youth. Well, it does what it did for you. I mean, for me, the great joy, the greatest, one of the greatest joys, it, well, first of all, for me as a young person, it was reading those books that made me want to do science, just like yourself. But yeah. the greatest thrill now is just meet grown up men and women who are physicists who say they'd read a book of mine when they were younger, because I'm old enough now, like you, oh. <laughs> that they decided to become a physicist. Oh, just wait until they come. Oh, you are still alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, so that's great. And you read a book by Landau. That's wonderful. So that the that the joy, that joy of did they encourage you to read a lot, by the way? I'm often interested. Did you read a lot of books when you were younger or was it uh, just a few? Uh, I think I was just swallowing uh, the books because I loved it. Uh, it was not necessary to, in, uh, to encourage me. Oh, I don't know. It just I don't yeah, okay. remember anybody pressing me doing anything, in fact. Well, that that's was great. An interesting, interesting environment because they kind of created an environment where, if uh, uh, well, I maybe you know softly doing something which was somewhere in the background, but it was I never was uh, under the pressure that I must uh, well perform uh, or whatever. Well, that's good. But also everything I know about me tells you that even if you were under pressure, it would have had no difference whatsoever, that you do what you want to do, regardless of the pressure. As far as I can tell, that's well, one of your characteristics. Maybe I would do otherwise, you know. Yeah. In if fact, pressure. In fact, yeah, if you were pressed to do one thing, you might do the other just out of just out of obstinacy. If I if I if, if I know you yeah. well enough um, now. But but you never thought of doing something other than science, like literature or history or anything like that. That was not an no. interest well uh, there was a period in my life when i enjoyed to paint slightly okay uh, but it was not serious at the moment when uh, i i took some lessons uh, for a while from one really good painter oh. and when somebody told my parents oh your son is going to be a painter this was the last time I uh, went to this person for a class. <laughs> so they did have a subtle influence one way or another. Well, it's true. Painters, it's hard to get to make a living as a painter. Um, now, when you were young, um, the last thing I want to talk about that period before he became a geologist is Stalin was still in power, right? And so do you remember that? Uh, that time it did not imprint in my memory because... Uh, it was, uh, uh, well, in the beginning of 50s, he was already out. And uh, at that time, I was not caring who, well, uh, lives outside of my house. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wondered about that. You were no longer interested in, in, in geology and decided to, uh, you wanted to do physics as a trader. Um, but, and did you, so you, you continued high school. I wonder what high school was like there. Were you, were you allowed to specialize already? I mean, in like in England, you can specialize. In the United States, you have to take all these courses. But but in high school, did you just focus on physics and science? Or uh, when, well, first... when I was in the eighth grade, uh, it was not specialized, and it was pretty mediocre. Uh, in the ninth, ninth grade, ninth grade uh, there was already like an exam before you go to this. It was math-oriented school. Uh, actually, it consist of three different classes two of them uh, math and uh, computing and this uh, third one 
was uh, mostly girls studying music and art, etc. It was really a really strange uh, combination. Uh, but yeah, so so it was excellent school. It was an excellent. It was an excellent. It was a specialized high school. It was an excellent high school. Yeah. yeah. And then and then so that's was that was your experience, and you went to an excellent high school, and um, and you knew already you had your ability in mathematics. Uh, did you have colleagues? Did you have friends who 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 were interested in science that later became scientists, or were you in 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 the school? I had my friend who later, together with me, uh, uh, entered Moscow State University. We were studying together with him, uh, but uh, then it's just different people have different uh, well attitude. How exactly they what they should follow and for how long. Yeah, okay so. yeah now you okay so you graduated from high school and you i was wondering um i don't know about the district i knew about enough in my area about the different institutes in russia but you went to moscow state university was there any choice did you decide that was going to where you go because your parents were there or were there or was it the best school or was it just a matter of being nearby or what it, it was the best school uh, there was a comparable uh school uh far away from, uh, well, not far away, near Moscow. It was Physical Technical Institute, which was uh, and continue being very, very good. But uh, uh, for me, uh, Moscow University seemed natural. Uh, when I was a geologist, I attended some groups of people in geological uh, department coming there. So uh, it was natural for me to go there. Sure, sure, sure. And you're able at university. You're able to focus right away on physics. You didn't have to take a broad. Uh, mostly, uh, they emphasize of mathematics and everything yeah, else. You do whatever you want. Yeah, just okay. So that yeah, very, more like England in that sense that you could focus early on on your interests rather than spread out. Now, this was during. I was working out the ages. So you were born in 1948. So you must have entered university around you know probably 1960 four or so or for 65 or something like yeah, that something like that, yeah. and that so, was sort of still the height of the cold war and do, do you remember for example i will i'm just asking because i I've, i don't think i've ever asked anyone i've known from soviet union at that time do you remember for example the cuban missile crisis when you're in high school was that a big deal uh well for me <laughs> it wasn't i have my life around okay uh, i did not understand what is going on but what I do remember when I was in Moscow University in 68, when uh, Russians uh, uh, well, put their army to Czechoslovakia, this is something which I remember very well. And it was not very pleasant. Okay. And Were you already a sort of a dissident in your mind at that time? An um, officer came to give a lecture in our group explaining how necessary it was, because you know, well, comrades, uh, the, they have army there, they have tanks, two tanks, comrades. <laughs> so when, I, when you hear it once, that is for all your life, you remember it. Yeah, that yeah. there was a reason for invasion. They have two tanks. Two tanks, yeah. No, well, okay. So already you're, you had that, rec you already had begun to recognize you're sort of not quite a dissident in that, not a vocal dissident perhaps, but already that that you were not buying into the sort of uh, Russian well, Empire. It already happened when I was in school because I also liked poetry. And uh, no, I, I, and, I was reading about I, that. I uh, used to learn it by heart and um, well, uh, I learned by heart quite a lot. And part of it, because uh, a substantial part of it was forbidden. Okay. Where did like, you get it? Uh, if it was forbidden, where did you find it? <laughs> That's the secret. Okay. <laughs> you can we, tell we me have, now. I think you're we, safe. We have, uh, some is that. You some is that. Some is that. Some okay. means myself. Okay. Uh. Is that means a publishing company. So you just type it on the typewriter and give it to your friend. No, and no, but where friend. did you get it so you could type it? Who who <laughs> did you learn it from? Maybe you're afraid to tell me. I, I typed it on my typewriter and it helped me to memorize it. No, no, but hold on. Uh, that, what I'm asking you is, you had to see it somewhere in order to type it on your typewriter. So w if it was forbidden, how did you get it in the first place? Well, you have a culture of friends. Yeah, so okay. you had other friends who gave it to you, 
And it was your, it was was your schoolmates. Yeah. Kids will, whatever's forbidden, kids will learn how to do. I just wondered. Also, my parents, whatever, uh, as I say, they called Andrei Sakharov, Andrei. Okay. So let's tell you a little. Okay. And yeah. Okay. Well, okay. That's good. But as we'll get to later, that memorizing that poetry turned out to be very useful to you later in life, but we'll get there. Um, uh, uh, But uh, I I know that fact. But um, the, I, I, the reason I was interested in your in 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 you remembering in high school the in, invasion of Czechoslovakia is um, it is true that you uh, I didn't know this till recently that you'd that you were one of a number of Russian um, sort of expatriates scientists and other people who who, who wrote uh, a, a public letter uh, pro- condemning the Russian invasion of uh, of Ukraine recently, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, we don't have to go into that much, but it's interesting to know that. Um, but presumably, of course, you had to keep all that, as you say, secret, because uh, if you it, let me ask you another question, if you would, if that hadn't been secret, would it have affected your ability to go to Moscow State University? Or would have they have kept you out or no? Well, uh, let's uh, express it differently. There were some dissidents who were actually fighting. OK, uh, and there are some people who were just thinking differently but they were not active uh, like warriors sure. and for me at that stage of my career doing physics learning who i am etc it was uh, uh, the most important thing yeah uh, sure and also uh, i had a um well maybe many of us had this feeling that it is uh, practically impossible to change anything mm-hmm. And then one or two people like Andrei Sakharov come and they would be actively uh, well, uh, fighting for uh, freedom and helping other people, etc. <clears throat> so the best we could do really, uh, not being academicians and uh, three times heroes of Soviet Union, mm-hmm. uh, we were able to uh, uh, just help them a little, okay? Like, for example, as I said, when Sakharov was in exile, people from our Levy Physical Institute were the only one who officially were um, allowed to come there. Oh. So each time it was a very, very sad journey. Mm-hmm. And sometimes with unpredictable consequences, uh, but uh, somehow probably one hand did not know what the other hand was doing. So we did not pay uh, uh, the price. But it was not pleasant. Okay, and no, some I, people decided not to go. <clears throat> okay, no, I understand, and 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 you know, it, it being a distant in your mind, but focusing on physics at the time is was the number one thing to do. I think it's it's probably true for many. Say at the same time in America, there were many people who were say against the Vietnam War, but who were instead of spending their time protesting while they were against it, they focused on their studies, and that's not an unusual experience in the late 60s or early 70s. I know one of my friends from England who at that time also, instead of protesting, he had one choice instead of being mobilized, actually. Okay. He spent one or two years on the North Pole, on the South Pole. Oh, so he could really, so he wouldn't have to go. (laughs) So now you go there for pleasure. Yeah, 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 okay. But last bit of Sovietology, maybe. It's occurred to me the when I was young, my experience of sort of Soviet dissidence was uh, reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yeah. Did you know of him when you were there? Of course. Yeah. Some is that. Okay. Okay. The same agency publishing same agency. agency. Okay. Now, um, so people knew of his work and and and. Um, yeah, yeah, we were reading it. Yeah, I mean, I remember reading it nice and 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 uh, impacting my impression of what was going on. Um, okay, you graduated in just in physics or physics and mathematics, or was there that distinction from university? It was physics. Yeah. Okay, and then you went to Lebedev as for graduate student, right? Again, because yeah. that was the best place, or why? Oh, uh, because my uh, advisor, while I was in Moscow University, my advisor was David Kirchnitz, who was a professor of physics at Lebedev. I see. So he was a professor at physics at Lebedev, but he was your advisor at Moscow State? Yeah. That was possible. Yeah. Well, it was kind of 
uh, Moscow University was mainly focused on teaching. Mm -hmm. There were some decent professors there, but the best ones were in academy. Okay, so the, the, that's so, right. So there were teachers at the university and there were academi academicians and they were institutes. That's the way the, the, the Soviet system works. Academicians is the top. <laughs> is the top. And they were yeah. always at private institutes, or not private, but separate institutes of research. So they were uh, at research institutes and every now and then they would go and teach at the university. Is that uh, right? Well, w Lebedev Institute was a research institute. In our institute, there were some academicians who are oh. members of Academy of Sciences. Yes. And some mere mortals. <laughs> and uh, well, most of us were in this category. Uh, yeah, but it was active research and mm -hmm. almost no, uh, unless you really want to, then you don't teach. You don't have to teach. It's a nice system. Um, because yeah. it means, first of all, it means the people who are at the university are actually interested in teaching, which is not always the case at, at universities here. And yeah. so it was that it's a nice separation if you can afford to do it. It's a lovely life to be in a research institute like there or the Institute for Advanced Study in the US where you can focus on research and, and, and only teach if you want. But Kirschnitz did did take students on. I guess he, he spent time at you said at, you got he was your advisor as an undergraduate as well. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, uh, my mom knew somebody this somebody knew me i knew all of them and they told me well you know uh, this other somebody his name was eugene feinberg he gave a lecture in polytechnical institute in moscow discussing non-local theories uh, like a uh, violation of florence invariance which mm -hmm. nevertheless happened on micro uh, scale, so maybe you can do something. And I was so excited. And there was one person in Lebedev Institute who did just exactly that. And I came to him, and uh, uh, he was also recommended. And uh, I thought that uh, I, this is what I'm going to do, some fancy physics. Mm -hmm. And I learned some also fancy mathematics, so I came with the ideas of my own. And he told me, okay, uh, to start with, Let's calculate the cross section of neutrino on anti neutrino. And I was so disappointed. <laughs> but, okay, so I calculated it. It was okay, doable. Mm -hmm. And then he said, now let's uh, calculate it with electromagnetic corrections. Mm -hmm. So, why do I need to do it? Well, in a year from that, I was already excited because I invented my own method to read some, some diagrams, which was not published at that time. My uh, diploma in Moscow University got some first prize. Uh, and after that, when I graduated, I came to Kirchnitz. This was January uh, 72. And I expected him uh, to tell me, OK, so now let's publish, because this is already good work. I knew that he liked it. And the first thing that he told me when he had seen me was, Okay, forget about everything you, which you just did. I say, oh, well, okay, well, let's just <laughs> publish this first. No, 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 forget about this. Here is a preprint which describes the paper by Herod Hooft. So now we know how really to calculate these radiative corrections. World is changing. The physics is completely different. So just learn it. And I learned it. And I am so happy that I obeyed because... <laughs> Okay. Otherwise, I would do this stupid thing. Uh, now, all along, that was Kirschnitz who was telling you all this. All you didn't say. Yeah. So the original one who was made you calculate the neutrino anti neutrino cross section was Kirschnitz as well. Yeah, but oh. but be, because he knew the difference in quality, um. and also uh, he recognized that this theory of electroweak interactions. Is similar to superconductivity. Yeah. Well, let's go. hold on, hold that thought. I know that. And by the way, the, I should say the first time I heard your name was a, was knowing about the paper of Kirschnitz and Linde. I, that's how, yeah, I, yeah. when I first before that was the first my first introduction to you. I should say, and yeah. I was, I didn't know at the time, of course, not too much later, and that he was your supervisor. But you also wrote somewhere that in 1971, some yeah. professor told you not to go into particle physics because it was a dead field. Uh, that was a Kirshnitz, I assume. That was someone no, else. I, I, I would not name him. Okay. okay. But but he was pretty convincing because he was studying 
axiomatic quantum field theory, uh, axiomatic field theory, which was it, just a, a sterile yes. air, dead end field. Yeah, but but I was learning it. It was the best at that time. Yeah. yeah. And when we were graduating, uh, this person gave our class of theorists an advice that we should not go to theoretical physics because the theoretical physics is a dead field. Uh, I trust me. I know. I study axiomatic field theory, and Hamiltonian is already dead. And the best accelerator in the world, which we have right now in Dubna, okay, <laughs> it is not going to produce much. So it is just a dry field. So don't do something else. But it was already too late for me. <laughs> I was already was, you were already in love with it. And it's, I mean, as you say, at 1971, it wasn't such a crazy thing to say because the 1960s yes. had been a very confusing time well, and looked like each accelerator produced more particles it seemed like a complete mess now. you can yeah. repeat it now and yeah. look smart <laughs> yeah there wasn't that well except the difference between now and then was then there was a lot of data coming out a lot of data but none of it was understandable now there's less now all the data is understandable which is unfortunate because we want some data that we don't understand but 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 the difference but at the time it seemed like no theory was going to work and it was all just chaos and it was right before the revolution in particle physics where in a period of of, of three or four years from you know 1971 and 1975 what is now the standard model of particle physics suddenly blossomed and from knowing not from understanding nothing we essentially understood almost everything it was kind of an amazing time you remember that when you were that was during your grad during your graduate time i guess right yeah I guess this is one of the reasons why I think uh, my generation was just like these years was very, very lucky because we were coming fresh to the new field, which was just emerging. And that was magnificent. Yeah, no, you, yeah, it was, it's the right place at the right time. So we we're lucky. And it was now, I want to talk later about the difficulty and which you experienced of being a Russian, we'll call you Russian rather than Soviet, being a Russian scientist at a time when you're it was difficult to publish outside and therefore i remember i mean that we we used to say that everything we knew of had also been done in russia the russians would say we all did it first but no one knows about it and it was the standard line we'd hear from russian physicists but it was often true the things had been done first in russia we just never learned about it because it was difficult we they couldn't publish and it would take years before the russian physics journals were translated into english yeah. and, but, and sometimes this translation was uh, this was the reason for example one why one of my papers was never uh, known to anybody except for weltman um i i in uh, 74 i've written a paper explaining that vacuum energy which is cosmological constant yeah well uh, it, it can be associated with scale of field uh -huh. and the scale of field changes its value if you heat it up Okay. Yeah. So then I've written a paper explaining all of this, and mm -hmm. Kirchner decided not to collaborate. He was very, very honest, and at this time he said, "No, you only yours." I've written a paper, and I gave it a name, uh, uh, which is in English translation should be, uh, "Is the cosmological constant really constant?" Oh. But in Russian, it is "постоянно ли." Cosmological постоянно, and Li means if. Okay? okay, it was translated as whether uh, the Li constant is a constant. Oh, <laughs> oh, so the okay. Li constant. No one knew what that was. No one read it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So things like that happen. It, we'll talk about because that affected your life a few times. I mean, I'm, I, 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 but I wonder to the other direction. Y so obviously you'd heard about this paper by Tuft. So while it was hard to get information out, how did the information come in? Did everyone learn read in English, uh, or and you had access to the English journals yeah, or no? Everybody, everybody read English. And you had access to the regular scientific journals like Physical well, Reports yes, or did. Physical Review, uh, and, 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 we, and we have uh, preprints which were arriving with a delay of two months, whatever. But they yeah. were arriving. Are, are they were arriving. arriving. I remember we used to send things to the Lebedev Institute even when I in the nineteen eighties when I was a. At Harvard, yeah. uh, in, in before that, in, in MIT, yeah, there'd be we'd send our preprints to to Russia. Um, so you got them and, and physics letters. So you got the journals when they came out. Not um, yeah, okay. We delay, but we we got them. 
Now, to, to move slowly into more into the physics, um, Kirschnitz was your advisor. You went there in, uh, in, in 72, I guess, right, into the Lebedev Institute, yeah. um, which is a great time in physics, as you say. And already, um, the, what was then, I mean, even though it had been developed in 1967, it was only after Gerard de Tuft demonstrated that the theory made sense uh, in, a quantum, in a quantum sense, it was what we would call renormalizable, that people began to take it seriously. And, and, uh, and well, you look like you want to say something, so go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's it just another interesting thing. Uh, when I started paying attention, and other people start paying attention, we have found that in our own institute, there are at least three, three persons who studied the same thing like Hooft studied, and who obtained the similar results sometimes almost simultaneously, sometimes earlier. And one of these people was Renata Kalash. Yes, yes. I... Okay. So uh, I decided to learn, and I asked their permission when they discussed it. It's Kalash, Fratkin, and Tutin. And when they were discussing it, well, in my idiotic mind, because I, it was above my pay grade, but I wanted to learn. It was very painful. So I was following them like that when they were discussing. And yeah, this was educational. Yeah. And you, but 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 tell me the truth. Was it only the physics you were following? Well, <laughs> I mean, were you uh, motivated as well by? I mean, you know, she, I, I, she was she was so out of my league. It was just impossible to say. And I was. That's lovely to hear. That's a lovely yeah, thing to say. And, and uh, uh, I just remember that when Kirchnitz tried to discuss something which we did with him. Uh -huh. And I was in this uh, auditorium when he was there, and Renata was sitting uh, just near me in front, and he said something that we with Linda did this, and she asked somebody, and who is Linda? <laughs> and I guess at this time, I thought, well, at least this is how I remember it now, and you yeah. know, your memory sometimes yeah. cheat you. I thought, oh, maybe your children will be Linda. <laughs> oh, isn't that wonderful? And they were. And then you and and you know, as we for the public may not know that you and Renata got married, but but I didn't. I have to admit because I I got to know her more from her work later on and string related to string theory and that. But I know that she, they had basically sort of uh, continued the proof of that uh, of renormalizability that that a Tuft had done. Uh, I didn't realize that she'd done that, and she was as, was she still a student at that time? Uh, no, she was uh, like, uh, I, I don't know how it is in, in translations. She was like uh, a postdoc, associate, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, she and Tudin were actually the first to relate proof of unitarity with proof of renormalizability in this theory. Wow. And after that, Hooft and Weltman did it in a different way. Uh, so they uh, kind of, the, there is even a reference to the paper in the paper by Hooft and Weltman. So sometimes there was a contact with, between us, but we at Lebedev, we didn't know what these guys are doing. They study some crazy young Mills fields. Okay. Oh. So we were doing real physics, neutrino, anti neutrino. Oh, okay. I see. Oh wow, that's okay. And of course, for you know, a Tuft development later won the Nobel Prize for the work they did. Yeah, and and for for people who don't know, but but you were at the right place at the right time because your supervisor tuned in early on to the electroweak theory, which which yeah. which had been developed by Weinberg and Salam and Glashow and others. This theory that later become became a central part of the standard model, and I didn't realize. So he was the first. Well, at least I don't know if he was the first one, but to kind of appreciate this connection between the electroweak theory and superconductivity, um, was he the first one to sort of really appreciate uh, that I, connection? I, I think that he was the first uh, because usually when we were even later, when we were trying to explain what is going on to our high energy colleagues, they were saying, but where is the temperature in the Lagrangian? Yeah. What are you talking about? There is no temperature in Lagrangian. Okay, so that that was very 
hard. Zildovich, well, it, two years later, uh, after we already did it, he was the first from this other group of people who were suddenly very much interested. Zildovich, Pobzarev, Okun. Uh, uh, so they were they took it very, very seriously. This is Zeldovich, you say? Zeldovich, yes. Yeah, I guess you pronounce it differently. I mean, for me, Zeldovich seems like a major... I never got <laughs> oh, to yeah. hear he, him or see him, a towering figure. figure. Yeah, he was a major figure. He, at some uh, moment, uh, well, suggested me to uh, to work on cosmic strings at the time when it didn't exist. I calculated something for about cosmic strings, and it did not seem interesting for me, yeah. and I told him so. And uh, so he had written a, a paper about it himself. And yeah. a, a later it was followed and strongly uh, developed by Alex Vilenkin, who became a champion in that. Mm -hmm. So it became a big, big deal uh, later. But, uh, well, uh, uh, instead of that, I was... You, you did okay. I wouldn't. I think you did okay. <laughs> Alex did fine too. Um, but but this finite, the fact. So let's just for the for people who aren't aware of this. So the point about the relationship between superconductivity and electric weak theory is that in superconductivity in a in a in a in a, in a superconductor, electromagnetism is short range. The existence of these things called Cooper pairs means that that the electromagnetic field, instead of being one over R squared, just falls off yeah. and it acts like the photon has a mass. And yeah. here we have in the electroweak theory, you have electromagnetism, which is, which is long range, but there's yeah. another force where the particles that convey the force have a mass and that force is very short range. So it's only over the size of the nucleus. And so in retrospect, that that relation, that analogy seems obvious, but at the time, and the point of superconductivity is superconductivity only happens below a certain temperature. Above a certain temperature, these Cooper pairs don't form and electromagnetism is long range. So that phase transition as a function of temperature is natural in condensed matter. But as you say, in field theory, normally it, you, you, everything's at zero temperature and you don't think about that. It took a, a while for people, I imagine including Kirshenitz and you, and then other people to develop the idea of what's called finite temperature field theory. You want to explain that a little bit? Well, it just uh, uh, the tem uh, quantum field theory at finite temperature, it was not our invention. We just applied it to the <clears throat> most interesting um, uh, field to, to study. Um, yeah, in, in fact, it happened to be easier sometimes, or at least for me, because uh, superconductivity is, well, three-dimensional something. It was not Lorentz invariant. Or, yeah. uh, but I found uh, that sometimes this phase transition, uh, uh, evaporation, if you wish, of the Higgs field happens by a first order phase transition, so abruptly. I, uh, I found it somewhere in 75, whatever. And when I told about this to Kirnitz, uh, he said, but I, I think that people do not know that this is possible in uh, superconductivity. And then uh, we learned later that later with some delay, they found also some way of describing first or the phase transitions uh, in uh, while heating in superconductivity using similar methods. But wow. Uh, we we did it. We did it first. first we did it first <laughs> because it's easier. It is you have a relativistic theory where, yeah. and maybe just um, how to say, people use it, this language already quite uh, quite a lot. So we have power of the methods uh, which we were able to apply. And for That's solid right. state physics, it was not necessary. It's like quantum okay. mechanics. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it, and okay, so that's interesting that that they w that they found that afterwards in superconductivity. But the idea is quite clear that if look, it, it makes sense if it's, if you heat up a superconductor and the superconductivity goes away, if you heat up the universe, then maybe the distinction between the weak interaction, which is mediated by heavy particles, and the electromagnetism will go away, and the particles will 
they all behave the same and they won't and, and they'll all be long range forces that makes sense but that's the work that um Kirschnitz and 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 you, you you sort of focused on the fact that at high enough temperature which meant automatically one is thinking about the early universe without even necessarily calling it the universe early universe that at high enough temperature the electroweak symmetry is restored and and what, i assume yeah. that you guys were the first people to show that is that right uh yeah and uh, uh, what was interesting for us, there was also later Weinberg and, uh, and Dolan and Chakiv, mm -hmm. and all of us were thinking that this is at first, and that this is a second order phase transition, which means it happens smoothly. Yeah. Okay? So scale field just gradually disappears. And that is what we found with Skirnitz uh, in somewhere 75 and tried to publish, but I made a mistake sending it to a wrong person, okay. criticizing him at that same time, okay? So it uh, appeared a year later in 76. Uh, we found that the phase transition can be first order. And when it happens, the energy of the cosmological constant mm -hmm. hits the universe, which is, as you understand, this is the basics of inflation. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, yeah, in fact, we'll get to that. But I want to I want to talk for people a little bit who may not understand the difference between first and second order. But before we do that, I, I was interested that Weinberg was part of the group that had sort of refined, if you want to call it, refined and developed a comprehensive picture of doing this yeah. finite temperature field theory calculation and what happens. Yeah. I'm what I mean, I was influenced by Weinberg because, you know, I learned most yeah. almost all my I took almost all my courses from Weinberg, even though I was yeah. at Harvard. Um, yeah. He must have been, he was, uh, he was unlike many people, scholarly in his understanding of physics and must have, and knew the connections I would have thought early on to condensed matter. But he, he, he didn't, he, early on, he didn't, when he was developing this, he didn't ever discuss uh, the, what, the, the restoration of symmetry. It was only after your work that he did that, is uh, that right? It, it was after, but nevertheless, he was early. It was seventy-four. His paper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's yeah. I mean, yeah. you would imagine he would be one of the people that understand that. But now let's talk about because this is important for later on the physics that we want to talk about. The so a, a, a first order there when you have a tr when you, when things change like the like in a superconductor it's it becomes a superconductor and then and then a, a and then it's not superconducting or a magnet. When you heat up a magnet, it's no longer magnetized. That's what we call a phase transition in condensed matter physics and, and now in, in all of physics. But so that means something changes. And, and the question is, is the change smooth? In which case we call it a second order phase transition. Namely, does it go from one stage to another very smoothly without a lot of weird things happening? Or is it or something else happened. If it's a first order phase transition, can you describe just so people understand what happens during a first order phase transition? Oh, it's very easy. I you, know you, can. You, <laughs> you, you, you take your teapot and boil it. Yes. So uh, this is what happens. You have uh, bubbles appearing in water and these bubbles expand, expand, and eventually all water evaporates. So that was the uh, uh, simplest example of the second of the first or the phase transition. It's the formation of bubbles. That, yeah, that, that, that you have two different phases existing at the same time. Yeah. Very different properties. Yeah. A bubble it's and water are very different. Especially if your water is very very clean. Yeah. So then it can be superheated. Yeah. And then for a while you increase temperatures even above one hundred Celsius, and it still does not boil. And then you just drop a little bit of coffee and psh. And it's suddenly exactly boom. Yeah. And also I, I like to use the analogy often when, of not heating, but cooling. If you yeah, have yeah. water on, as you would have had in Moscow and I had growing up in Canada, if you have a street and it's well below zero Celsius, if the cars are going, the water gets sloshed around and it's still liquid, even though it should be frozen. And then when later on at night, when the cars aren't there, it suddenly goes boom and yeah. freezes and releases some heat at the same time. When it when it freezes because the state it wants to be in is frozen, and it's not. And I and 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 so there is a possibility in the case of 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 these tra phase transitions to to have it super cooled or superheated, where yeah. the transition should happen, but because of the it doesn't it takes something to make it happen. And of course we'll get there. And that that whole idea is is central to inflation. So um, 
Uh, so the first, so the important point is that the theory that we know and love, the theory that we know exists, the electroweak theory, as you showed, and as we now understand, unless you do something strange to it, ha when it goes from the state that we live in to the state that it w at early times in the early history of the universe when it was hot, it, that that transition, or if you want to say it the other way around, the transition from when it's hot to cold is first order in the theory that we know and love in most well, cases it, it's it's a bit tricky uh, in real life uh when you come to the point co close to the uh, phase transition then physics sometimes become more complicated than a textbook so we thought that it is really uh, first or the phase transition and sometimes it might uh, but in some other places uh, in some other cases there are some special name for that also coming so things may be more complicated it's dirty yeah. science. You you need to uh, make not quantum field theory calculation, but do them on lattice or whatever uh, to get the final truth. Yeah, it's very complicated. That's it. I mean, that's understanding in, physics in, near the phase transition to be quite complicated. In unified theories, you would uh, naturally mostly expect uh, first of the phase transition. Yeah, and and that's that's one of the reasons that that to to pre to preempt ourselves that the universe didn't inflate when the when the universe when that when the phase transition happened when the universe was about a millionth of a millionth of a second old i think is when the electroweak phase transition yeah. happened when it was pretty old it was already a millionth of a millionth of a second old that's pretty old and and it and it and it didn't it didn't accelerate but there was a phase i, I can't resist before we get on there was a phase transition in your life at the same time as this because as you pointed out in the seminar, when Renata asked who's Linde, you tried to follow her around and learn what she was doing. But it was two years later, and my understanding, and I could, because I mentioned it earlier, I think it's important that I bring it up now, that that ability of yours to learn the Russian poets by heart when you were a high school student paid off. Do you want to explain how? Uh, well, it just... Um... Uh, we happened to be, and uh, this was really a coincidence, we happened to be at the same uh, uh, lake uh, uh, at the same time. And uh, and then what to do? We were, well, on the boat. And I was reading, I, I, I came, we came there uh, in my, again, in uh, a car of my parents, uh, just to come to this place. And... Uh, uh, I was reading her uh, poetry uh, like maybe three days uh, nonstop uh, by heart and singing songs. Don't ask me to sing songs now. I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so somehow it worked. It worked. Somehow you convinced her. Somehow you won her heart and she had already won yours. And yeah. the rest is history. And, and, uh, and you've been happily married ever since. And it's a lovely story. I thought that that story of the poetry was worth mentioning in the midst of this physics because, well, it, it not only actually formed a love collaboration and a family collaboration, but later on um, led to physics collaborations, which is also a nice yeah. thing and affected your work later on, which we'll get to. Um, but the other, the, to get to this first order phase transition, one of the characteristics that's, that happens clearly in boiling water that you notice is that the system is very, as we say, inhomogeneous. If, if you look at it, that's very different in different places where it's where it's vapor and water. I mean, you couldn't imagine a more, forgive me the, for the word, chaotic uh, situation where 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 you have great inhomogeneities and um, and uh, and you would imagine, in fact, that would not reflect our universe, which seems to be uniform. As far as you can see, everywhere, and that, and that, and that, um, that inhomogeneity of a first order phase transition. In fact, it's it's surprising. It's recognized immediately in condensed matter systems, but very shortly thereafter, a a proposal was made to describe our universe by our good friend Alan Guth, um, uh, uh, which he called inflation, which relied on a first order phase transition. And um, one might say, in retrospect, one could say, how could that describe our universe? Because our universe is smooth and a first order phase transition isn't. And um, it's kind of remarkable um, that it, 
it persisted. And we'll explain, what, well, I'll take your take on it in a second. But before we get there, I was a, I was there in the United States when Alan was there. In fact, Alan was on my thesis committee when I was at MIT. Um, mm -hmm. He was one of the few nice people and, uh, and, um, uh, and encouraged me. Uh, but there was a hero or at least a star in, the, in Russia that I never heard of named Starobinsky. Yeah. Um, and what I learned from reading your stuff is that Starobinsky had proposed a model that was essentially similar to Alan Goose, although he didn't emphasize the important physics that made inflation suddenly capture the world. But he was already well known and his ideas were lauded yeah. in, the, in, in, in the Soviet Union in 1979, which is a year before Goose. So you want to explain that a little bit? We were actually in the same group in Moscow State University uh, learning uh, physics. Uh -huh. But he was working with uh, Zildovich and he was very good in uh, um, studying quantum effects in gravitational field. Okay, um, So at some moment, he uh, issued a paper saying that if you consider many, 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 many particles giving contribution to vacuum energy or gravitational field, then it's equivalent to changing Einstein equations a little bit. And if you take these extra terms into account, you may find the regime of de Sitter expansion of the universe, exponential expansion. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to use it for solving singularity problem. He actually read, this, uh, have written in this paper something like we assume that our universe initially is absolutely homogeneous. Okay. Huh. And he used it to address the uh, sing singularity problem. But there was a problem with this addressing because uh, it was also clear from his paper and from subsequent paper by Mukhanov and Chibisov that the vacuum, this vacuum state uh, due to quantum corrections is unstable and decays quickly. So you cannot really have the universe living infinitely long until this time because mm -hmm. you would die first, okay? okay. So it cannot be uh, an initial state unless the universe was spontaneously created from nothing, yeah. okay? Yes, okay, but... <laughs> yeah, well, we, we both like a universe from nothing. It's been very good to me and it's been very good to you too. But, yeah, and, okay, and, but, but with, with Stravinsky, this was a gap and also whether it works or not. And uh, Sakharov loved uh, this uh, work. It became pretty famous among Russian cosmologists. Uh, I did not like it for two reasons. Uh, first, it is uh, uh, this fact that what was the initial point? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second is that really to make it work, you need to have like billions of different types of particles to give a contribution of a very special type, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So, I, uh, but uh, later he just will gradually change it, uh, this story and he just forget about this initial uh, I, uh, suggestion to do it all by these quantum fluctuations and instead just left one additional terms in the uh, R squared term in the Einstein equation. And this was sufficient if the coefficient in front of it was enormously large, okay? okay so so it, it worked. And what we learned right now that this idea, which was well, like more than 40, 40 years ago, it was in yeah. 1980. Yeah. Uh, right now, it is still one of the most successful models of inflationary cosmology. Uh, at that time, it was not even considered inflation because he did not pretend solving all of these problems. Yeah, so, that was the difference. I mean, I think that the, yeah. the, there's a difference between, it's interesting, there's a difference between people who do the work and people who, who do the work and convince the world that it's interesting. And the, the key thing that Alan Guth did that was, well, many things. I'm, I'm a, we're both friends with Alan and he's a good friend and I admire him tremendously. But um, uh, is that Alan realized suddenly that it, that not only if you had this period when the universe was in this super super cold state, if you want to call it that, where 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 it, where it was dominated by what we now call vacuum energy, where where and then the phase transition happened. If that phase was long enough, the universe could expand exponentially for a very long time, and on, on at least on the time scales 
of interest, which is not something that that, that Starobinsky had, re- had emphasized. And that could solve all, or at least all at the time, the three fundamental problems in cosmology that were otherwise inexplicable, why the universe should be so flat, why it should be so uniform, and why it should be hot, if you want. And also, as people don't realize now, solve another big problem, which was really bothering us particle physicists at the time, I remember it vividly, why it, there should not be so many things called monopoles. That's a more sophisticated problem. But I think I remember in the United States, at least, because I was there at the time as a student and then and then at Harvard, that was the thing that made inflation so impressive. Yeah. You, this grand unified theory, this theory that unified the forces would automatically produce these particle called monopoles. They'd be super heavy and the universe should be full of them. And there seemed no way to get rid of them. And it's funny, now you never hear that talked about. But at the time, I think that was the thing that got most of the particle physics community interested in, at least in the United States. I'm wondering, I want to know in Russia at the time, first of all, how did you learn about the Guth result? And was that, and what impressed people about Guth's work? Was it the Bonapoles or was it the other stuff? So, so okay, I can tell you my part of the story. So I actually, uh, together with Chibisov, who later Chibisov and Mukhanov have written in a very important paper. So we studied with him uh, what happened when you have a strong, strong, strong supercooling. And we realized, of course, that the universe, because it's cosmological constant there, that it should be exponentially expanding. And then it produced bubbles, and these bubbles collide, and the universe becomes immensely inhomogeneous, and then, therefore, it is not our universe. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. And so I've written about this something very, very short in one of my reviews uh, in 78. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, I remember how Chibisov told me, and you know what? He was kind of melancholic person, said, Maybe it is also possible to use this for solving entropy problem. And I told him, what problem? What? So, uh, so that, that was how it was, OK? So we knew everything, and uh, we did not do nothing uh, about that at, at this time. Then I was at the seminar, uh, which was organized by Rubakov, uh, uh, one f- famous person who just- Yeah, a person I learned a lot from. I, have, I'm, I again, admire him tremendously. Yeah. Rubakov. So they, they uh, discussed the possibility of solving uh, a flatness problem due to cosmological, before Guth. Okay? Before Guth. Oh. Before Guth. Due to, uh, before Guth became known in uh, Russia. We, we did not get instant information, so I cannot right now tell you exactly who said something first. Okay, but uh, before we learned anything about Goose, this was the seminar, and they discussed this flatness problem, uh, which maybe can be solved due to phase transitions in the Coleman Weinberg model. Okay. And I was there, and they explained why it cannot be solved. Because, you know, this phase transition goes down and it does not. And I said, what flatness problem? Okay. And then okay. they explained this to me. And then I knew was all over the sides that, well, it does not work anyway. And then there was a call, phone call to me a couple of months later by Lev Okun. He oh. was a well famous uh, physicist in Russia studying electroweak theory, whatever. Um, and he asked me, Andre, did you hear uh, anything about this? Alan Guth paper, how you can solve the flatness problem. I told him, no, I do not know anything about that, but let me explain you why it does not work. And <laughs> so <laughs> half an hour I was explaining him why it does not work and, and stuff. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> and then I received the preprint and indeed <laughs> it did not work, but the idea was so exciting. Okay. Yeah, because so he emphasized was, not why the problem, but the solutions, if you wish. So that was why I got an ulcer. Oh, you... I believe ulcer of duodenum. I got it because I was stressed. This is such a beautiful idea. And I need just a little bit, maybe, to make it work. Okay. I see. So you... And... You uh... and I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. 
And then eventually in summer of 81, I realized something very simple. I was actually using a very bad computer is somewhere in the basement of Liberty Physical Institute studying tunneling. And I've noticed that sometimes tunneling does not go from the minimum to another minimum. Sometimes it goes some strange way. And I studied the condition for this strange way and realized that actually it quite often a possibility and somehow nobody studied it. Everybody assumed that you go from one minimum, one vacuum to another vacuum. But the powerful computer was okay. And then I still did not put one to one one and one together. Yeah. And then some night I realized that actually this solves the problem because the tunneling, if it is there, goes almost horizontally. So the vacuum energy almost preserved. And after that, you roll down, but you still have for a while large vacuum energy, and then interior of the bubble explodes. And I decided that must be everybody must know it because it's so simple. Uh, so I decided to call uh, Valery Rubakov. He uh -huh. was the first. <laughs> and I came hide somewhere with a telephone not to wake up my family. And they called him and asked, Valery, did you think about this? Uh, and he said, no. No, I don't know. Huh. And then I got really excited, yeah. excited, and I waked my wife and I told her, Renata, it seems that I know how the universe was born. <laughs> okay. But this was she in... said, Go back to sleep, or did what is it? Was... <laughs> well, we had a discussion. <laughs> oh, she woke up. Good, that was very good of her. Okay. Um, but let's I want to step back because obviously you and I can talk in the language we understand, but for the people hearing, they may not. Let me, I want to parse a few of these things more carefully before we go mm -hmm. on. Um, first of all, this flatness problem, just to make it clear, uh, once again, is that the universe is, 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 is looks very, looks like it's flat in the sense that it, 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 it you, the curvature of the universe is not really observable on any, on any scales. And that, like, like Earth is flat. Yeah, like the Earth is. Because like if I look big. out um, or here, I can see a little curvature. But if I'm in Kansas, I, I don't see any, and the Earth seems flat. And it's and it's so, the curvature of the Earth is is so small on human scales that it looks like it's flat. And and um, and and that was a problem because it it seems to be very in order to have a universe that looks flat after 14 billion years, the mathematics has to be incredibly fine tuned. But the reason this that this idea of inflation solves that that the, even the original Guth idea of inflation is that like blowing up a balloon, if the universe expands exponentially, any flat any curvature gets pushed very very far away. If you want, it becomes very small, and so it's just like blowing up a balloon, and it automatically a period of exponential expansion will solve if it even has as we say even if the exponential expansion is only. 50 times the original time scale, 50 E foldings, as we say, already you've basically made a universe that's flat to any measurable value. And that was a huge result. And that's one of the things that Guth emphasized that, that and one of the otherwise inexplicable problems that he solved. But the problem that you recognized early on and the problem that Guth alluded to at the end of the paper is, well, it solves that problem and it solves the other problems we briefly mentioned, but if it's a, if there's a phase, if the phase transition is first order, then these bubbles form of new phase, just like water, and they and 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 in principle, um, you know, you're going to end up with a universe that's totally inhomogeneous, and that doesn't look like our universe at all, which is very smooth now and uniform. That's actually so, that's an interesting interpretation. Uh, but if you want to uh, go ahead, but no, uh, no, no, no. If you want, I'm okay. always. I told you, you always correct me. So go ahead. Uh, and, an and that now. The following: uh, the way uh, the idea was that we live for a while in some state which is called false vacuum. Yes, okay? a false, false vacuum. vacuum. Is a real like vacuum, which means that the state where all invariances are present, you move, you walk with respect to anything, but there is nothing with respect to to move. It is totally, absolutely homogeneous and uniform and whatever. So there is no preferable coordinate system. 
there is no preferable choice of time mm -hmm. because in the sitter space, the same exponential expansion universe that described the sitter space, which was the point of so many confusions uh, from 1917 uh, when it was first discovered, uh, it in some coordinates it looks like collapsing, in some others look like expanding, and in some other coordinates look like static. Yeah. So if you do not have any uh, orienteers, anything with respect to which it expands, does it actually make sense to say that it is expanding at all? And if there is no preferable choice of hyper, and this is most important, preferable choice of time, then you do not have any preferable time for the universe to start expanding, uh, well, uh, to start decaying. Mm -hmm. And that is why decay of this vacuum-like state happens completely chaotically, and that destroys the homogeneity. Okay, that's a wonderful way of thinking about it. Yes, in fact, I've heard you say that, so that's great. But the solution that you came up with that night in the summer of 1981 when you woke up your wife and she was very kind to you and didn't yell at you for doing that um, uh, was the fact that, well, when these, I mean, physically, the way this is manifest, you, you talked about mathematically how we know this, but physically it's manifested by the collision of bubbles and this and reminding yourself of water that, and Goose Universe had lots of, at the end of inflation, there'd be lots of bubbles forming and that would screw everything up. But your realization was it's possible to have inflation inside of a single bubble. And so the whole universe can be not many bubbles, but one bubble. And, and because, as you point out in the language, you said it, that if by tunneling, the universe can go from one state to another, even inside the, the bubble, when naively you'd think there's no energy stored, it can happen that there's energy stored inside a single bubble. So the single bubble can expand exponentially. And that was the birth of what then I guess quickly became called new inflation. And that suddenly avoided the, what, what I guess Alan called the exit problem. I think I remember the, the a graceful exit. There graceful. was no graceful exit from the old inflation because it was a mess. But in this new inflation, if, 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 the, field, if, the, if the field, if you want to call it, whatever was governing this system at the time, caused the universe to complain, that field could gracefully go away slowly and uniformly everywhere throughout that bubble and turn into, as you were one of the people to calculate, um, and turn into the energy of normal stuff and end up with a hot, what we would now call a hot big bang. And yeah. then suddenly you solve the last remaining problem of inflation. Well, it looked like it solved the last remaining problem of inflation. It didn't. No, it didn't. Because, it didn't. and as, as Stephen Hawking, and you and I both know Stephen and, and admire him, but we also knew that Stephen was not a fan because he didn't invent it partly. And in my, and, and he realized, and, and um, I think he learned from you that there was a, that there was a problem, right? Uh, he was in 1980, uh, 81 at a conference in, in the Soviet yeah. Union. Uh, no, he, uh, the story was like that. There was a conference and uh -huh. they gave a talk. Yeah. And at that time, this was like almost well four months after I actually written the paper and I finally got the permission. It was in October 81. And everybody started suggesting me that we can smuggle the paper abroad. But uh, that, I already that's important. It. You were still at a time when a Russian scientist, yeah. so you could do stuff, but you couldn't, you weren't allowed to publish it abroad okay. and people like us didn't hear about it. So go on. Yeah, well, so... Uh, uh, no, but then uh, the day after my talk, uh, uh, Hawking gave a talk at Sternberg Institute of uh, Astronomy in Moscow State University. And I have heard about it and I came there and then all of a sudden they asked me to translate what he said. And that was one of the experiences of my life because at first, usually Steve at that time, he would just ask his student to give a talk. And then if he was unhappy, he would say, blah, blah, and his student will change something. Other. But this time uh, they came completely unprepared. Uh, so Steve would say one word, student would say one word, and then I would translate this word. Uh, but fortunately, they were discussing exactly this old inflation. And uh, Steve Hawking had another way of proving that it's impossible to improve it. 
Okay, that was the origin of my culture, you know. <laughs> and uh, Alan have written a paper with Eric Weinberg proving that it's impossible to improve it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was translating what Steve said. At, at some moment, it became uh, intolerable that it just was so slow. So after Steve say one word and students say one word, then I will speak for five minutes. <laughs> and then, so it continued. I explained why it cannot be improved. And then uh, Steve said uh, something which was translated by his students, something like that. But recently, Andre Linde suggested a way how to improve it, and I have it translated. And then next word was, but unfortunately, uh, it's wrong. And he started explaining why my paper is wrong. And I was translating it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, me, a young uh, person who is not yet will uh, have a clear uh, guaranteed future. Yeah. And here the best people of Russia were wa watching how he <laughs> explains why <laughs> I'm doing stupid things. Okay. So I uh, translated and I say I translated, but I disagree. And I explained why. And they asked Steve, do you want me to well, tell you more about that? And he said, voila. Well, uh. And we disappeared in one room of this institute. And for about two hours, all institute was in panic because they did not notice where Steve disappeared. They thought that the famous British scientist disappeared. Tomorrow it will be in newspapers. <laughs> okay. And meanwhile, uh, I was at the blackboard telling him something. And he, from time to time, say, voila. Well, uh. And his student would say, Oh, but you did not tell that before. And we continue this manner. And then he invited me to his hotel. And then he starts showing photographs of his family. And we became friends, you know. Yes. I, I remember the period. I was, he, shortly afterwards, he and I had adjoining offices. He was visiting Harvard. Uh -huh. So I got to know him. And, and what people don't realize, because they know the Stephen of the computer now, but at that stage, he could still talk. And if you knew him well enough, which his students did, they could understand what he was saying. Other, to most people, it would sound like a mumble. I remember yeah. I, I was able to sort of understand a little bit, but whenever he gave a talk, he would say, mmm, 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 and then a student yeah. would, would repeat what he'd said. It was before the computer, and that was what was happening when you were, were doing that. And, and um, yeah, and it must have been very weird to be repeating Stephen Hawking saying that you were wrong when you knew you weren't. And um, it, it took in, some... In, some new inflation have died in its own uh, death, uh, not for this reason. Yeah, uh, it just well when people calculated amplitude of density perturbations, it appeared to be like way too high, and that was clear. Uh, that yeah, let let me let me parse that because in fact this whole idea, which is beautiful, did appear to suffer of a fatal problem, and it's due to quantum mechanics. And that actually, I believe, my first understanding of how it happened. Well, my best understanding of what's happened, I think I learned from you from one of your books early on. I, I learned it a different way, but it really made intuitive sense. And that basically is, and again, you'll correct me, I'm sure, but, but, but that is that, so everything's smooth, but while the universe is expanding, quantum fields are fluctuating. And if it expands long enough, the fields, the quantum fluctuations continue to grow and grow and grow. And so if you have this perfect, the sitter expansion uh, by the time it ends there'll be huge quantum fluctuations and those will produce huge inhomogeneity so a field which is uh, uh, an inflation which is almost exactly as we call the sitter which doesn't depart at all from 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 where the the field doesn't change at all during that time will allow the the quantum fluctuations to grow i think it's linearly with time um, I I forget whether it's linearly or quadratically. The square but, goes linearly. Yeah. Okay. The square goes linearly with time, and mm -hmm. then um, and that would produce two large fluctuations, and and that was the the fatal flaw in in this perfect idea of new inflation where the field didn't change very radically. So now you not, can not, you can it, change it was, you can improve my dis, my it, discussion. Yeah. It it was actually. Uh, well, uh, once man flaw, another man great discovery. It yeah. was first. Uh, discovered in Starobinsky model by Mukhanov and Chibisov in 81. Mm -hmm. And Mukhanov, I remember, he was sitting in a nearby office and he was trying to explain what is going on. And I told him, but it's nonsense because it's quantum fluctuations and the galaxies, how can you get galaxies from? 
Uh, it took me some time to understand, okay, uh, because these fluctuations, which are produced uh, uh, during inflation, they stretch. So their wave lengths, so they, they, they become exponentially large. Mm -hmm. And during stretching also, they do not oscillate. Yeah. There are some terms in the equation of motion that freeze them. So they were freezing and stretching. And then others freeze on the top. And there are others, just like you said. Okay. So uh, in uh, Starobinsky model, it actually works great. In uh, new inflation, he, uh, the amplitude of fluctuations is too large. And I first learned about it from Starobinsky. Oh. I attended some conference, uh, 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 which was, well, somewhere in the... Uh, you know, uh, like uh, close to Karelia in, in Russia. And it, uh, it was very, very disappointing for me. I'm learning, that, oh, maybe he is wrong, or maybe he's wrong. He said that the uh, amplitude of fluctuations are too large. Okay. So a uh, couple of months after that, there was a conference in Nafil. And Starobinsky came there with his already paper. And at that time, Hawking already issued his paper saying that fluctuations are too small. <laughs> no, to the, the, uh, they're just right. And then there was a Hawk, uh, goose sitting here and saying that, they had, well, let's calculate them. And then calculated they happen to be too large. Uh, and uh, then a group of three other people who a year later uh, published their paper. One way or another, it was Tarabinsky who uh, I know that he did it because the memory you cannot erase yeah, from sure. this disappointment. Okay, so it was Tartu, okay, a conference in Tartu. So what what can I do? Uh, so essentially, when we left Nuffield conference in Cambridge, which was the first conference on inflation uh, cosmology. Uh, yeah, was it was 1982. I remember that. I was invited to it and Harvard yeah. wouldn't give me money to go. And I really felt badly afterwards. But that was the conference where all these independent yeah. groups were com ca calculating yeah. supposedly the same thing, which is, could you make galaxies? And they're coming up with the, the fact that, and let me put it a slightly different way, the fact that in order for the, for the fluctuations to be small enough to be the seeds of galaxies, and not too large to destroy the isotropy, the microwave background, mm -hmm. then there'd have to be some parameters in this theory that had to be so fine tuned to be like one part in a million or one part in a million million. That's the meth that's the the lesson I learned. And it, it hurt me very much because I, I knew that if I'd been there, I would have been part of one of those groups. And I felt like trust I missed me, out. Hurt me. Trust me, it hurt me more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. hurt you okay. more. Okay. But I think that uh, the consequences of that were not quite understood for quite a while. Um, and one of the consequences is that you, if you need to change the theory to make it work, how you yeah. do it. And so what are ingredients? First ingredient is high temperature. Mm -hmm. sufficiently large coupling constants mm -hmm. to have uh, these phase transitions mm -hmm. and to have thermalization in the early universe so and then this heat, heat the universe up afterwards yeah yeah well okay so several different uh, assumptions and uh, what happened later and that was for me uh, uh, like one of these few shocking experiences because you know when you know that something is impossible and then something becomes easy that is oh how could it be uh, well so what what i found is that if you just have the simplest simplest scale of field without any maxima or uh, well this minimum whatever and without any high temperature phase transitions to get rid of it was the main pain for me because this was my theory, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the high temperature phase transition, that was what, but I remember what Kirchnitz told me once, just forget about it. Just yeah. Ignore it, okay? uh, you know, so, in fact, I think that's really, an I mean, your life has been an example of that, but that's one of the greatest beauty of science that I wish the public would, uh, would not only appreciate, but it, I wish it could disseminate it, is that, is that, Science, in science, you learn to th to forget, you know, that that something that you're willing to be wrong and also learn to throw out ideas, bad ideas, 
like yesterday's newspaper, regardless how, of how precious they are to you. It's an experience you have. And, and so many ideas in the real world are dogmatically held, even when they're obviously wrong. It happens in science too. But what makes science great and what makes some scientists great is that they can learn to throw out the bad ideas and accept the new ones. And your life throughout your career has been an example of taking your own ideas in some sense and we willing to throw them out. But the problem is this mostly psychological. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I do not consider myself like a, a great physicist in the sense that there are quite a lot of people who do math way, way better than me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have something uh, like intuition, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, another thing is, yes, indeed, if I see something clearly, then I don't care what other thing. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, the, and this, uh, like having a theory with a potential, like a harmonic oscillator or something like that, and having it lead to inflation, uh, then, oh, wow. And then you do not need the universe to be hot. I mean, this is uh, like you, you have this uh, snake which hypnotizes you. Uh, you know that there was a hot big bang. You know that there was a hot big bang. You know, right now I'm opening every textbook on, uh, on cosmology. Mm. They all start with describing the hot big bang. Okay. And it is not necessary. In fact, it is much more difficult to make a universe inflate if it starts with hot big bang. So I wonder what is going on. I sending these people message. Let me help you to write it properly because <laughs> your theory uh, was actually ruled out 40 years ago and you are still teaching your students this. And they say, yeah, but what can we do? We copied it from one particular place and now we have a copyright and we cannot change whatever this okay. guy's. So it's <laughs> it's amazing. It's, uh, but the, the, well, you, you take what is good and you just go forward. And well, and this, 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 this idea was revolutionary and surprising. Again, I, I, it, it, it's simple. Like many things in physics, it's simple in retrospect. But the notion that you realize when you went from this new inflation, which required just to remind, I want to, people may be confused. It still required a phase transition, but it was a phase transition that was different, that, that had a bubble, but, and our universe existed within one bubble. But what you realized is that, hey, no, you don't no, have to have a phase was, transition. This, this part was, you see, I did, I will not allow you. Okay. No, That's all right. Purity, purity of thought. Uh, in new inflation, this was the universe inside the bubble. Mm -hmm. In chaotic inflation, you do not need the bubbles. Exactly. That's the whole point. Oh, yeah. I okay. Gonna say, so I, I was just going to get there. I was going to say, suddenly, say. new inflation yeah. had a, a, a bubble, and suddenly you realize you don't need a bubble at all. You don't even need a phase transition. That if you have a universe with the simplest possible example of a, a, what we call a harmonic oscillator, but it, that may not mean anything to anyone, but you don't have to do, have any kind, weird kind of special initial conditions and then you can you explain what happens oh uh, actually one of the things which brought me uh, to it also about these initial conditions you may consider a smallest smallest possible universes like for example closed universe yeah. of a Planckian mass mm -hmm. uh, of a Planckian density but it is 10 to the minus five grams yeah it's nothing okay it's nothing uh, and it, if it is filled with a scale of field with maximal energy, which is Planckian energy. Okay, if a uh, potential energy of the field is greater than gradient and kinetic energy, then this thing becomes expanding, and within not ten to the minus twenty seconds, not it is within ten to the minus forty seconds, it becomes much greater than our universe. Okay, so. Mm -hmm you get energy from nothing. This looks like a more sophisticated, no, it's stupid. It is incredible way of cheating because you start from nothing. If you got used to the idea that energy is conserved, how you get, uh, well, this 10 to the uh, 90 almost particles surrounding us, invisible part of the universe, starting from 
no single particle at all. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so this is, um, uh, well, and no violation of laws of physics. This yeah. is what is strange. No violation of laws of physics. It's it's yeah. and that's the hardest thing to get to people to understand is that you can do it without any, as I like to say yeah. in my book, any supernatural shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. And, right. And then right. I got in trouble. For, well, I don't yeah. got in trouble. I just, some people don't like it. Although I, the way I heard it, I still think Alan's description, because it uses an a a a a, a phrase that's used that Americans are used to, is what the one that convinced me calling it the ultimate free lunch. You know, people say there's no such thing as a free lunch, and he would say the universe is an, the ultimate free lunch because oh. apparently from nothing you can get everything, and it doesn't violate any laws of physics. It's really kind of remarkable. Now, in okay. fact, we understand how that happens. It turns out the way general relativity works is that, that as the universe is expanding, the universe is doing work on the stuff inside. So it's not as if energy is violated. It's that the universe is doing work on the expansion and, and dumping well, energy into that system because of the of, of what yeah. we call negative pressure. But, but since you mentioned the sentence of Alan Booth, you know, I, I first time made an extension of what he, he did. And now uh, in 82, when there was this Nuffield Symposium, I actually issued a preprint about it, uh, eternal inflation in new inflation uh, scenario. Uh, and this was also after you know, uh, Steinhardt gave a talk there about that. And uh, uh, I still have a copy of the preprint. What was important there, that once you have this bubble or novel whatever happens uh, in different parts of the universe you may have this transition at that time it was transition but later it was different uh, happening independently so uh, if that is the way I know for example that in SU5 especially in supersymmetric SU5 mm -hmm. a dozen of different minima uh -huh. so you can fall to the right to the left straightforward whatever yeah. You fall into red minimum, blue minimum, green minimum with different physics in it. Mm -hmm. And they said, look, this is what you do. In the same universe, you have these different bubbles and symmetry is broken differently there. So you have all possible laws of physics compatible with your theory realized in different parts of the universe. Each of them is exponentially large. So I said, uh, this was in my concluding sentences of my uh, proceedings of Nuffield Symposium, that uh, the universe is not only a free lunch, uh, it is like an eternal feast where it produces all possible universes and all dishes are served. <laughs> so. Well, okay, now that's jumping way ahead because initially when you realize that you could just ha not have a transition, you could perhaps by a quantum fluctuation, enter into that state, which is what I talked about in my book, mm -hmm. and then that state could in, inflate. But then it, you weren't, but then you realize that it's even better than that. So that you call that chaotic inflation, yeah. but that the inflation could be eternal. And that was what's surprising because you think you'd have, if you have a field that's not, not at the bottom of its potential, you'd think it would fall down. That would be the sensible thing, but of course you, you do anything but that. Um, you realize that quantum fluctuations could change things. So could, maybe you could describe for a moment how it can become eternal for people. Okay. Uh, uh, I first then may tell you what is the advantage sometimes of leading in how you say totalitarian regime. <laughs> okay, um, it was in eighty five. Mm -hmm. I uh, live in a strange state. At, at this time, Gorbachev came to power mm -hmm. and decided to make perestroika. Perestroika means uh, you do everything as it should be. Kind of freedom, mm -hmm. uh, gradually destroy uh, previously existing bureaucratic machine or whatever. And one of the first things he did, he decided to uh, simplify our way of uh, getting permissions for publication. But the first thing he, which uh, was done, he, they de <laughs> destroyed previously existing system mm -hmm. without replacing it by anything. Oh, okay? yes. And for about a year, 
we are living with our mouth shut. So we could not send anything, uh, God forbid, abroad. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, this was depressing. You know, uh, it's uh, one of uh, my friends, actually Renata's brother, used to say that a cow need to be milked, you know, <laughs> otherwise it's painful. Uh -huh. So you say, and I cannot publish whatever I'm thinking about. It is God knows for how long. Okay. So this, then I start writing my book, book about inflation. I decided, okay, I know already chaotic inflation. Everything is done, nothing new. So let me just write it. I start writing it, hated it because I hate second time saying the same thing and you know, whatever and writing it and then using scissors and glue because there's no computer. So it was terrible. And finally, we finally got some money to buy maybe in the future a car. And I start learning how to drive the car. And I attending the school and at my age, it was already not so interesting, but on Moscow ice, Mm -hmm. When my instructor explained me in pure Russian, not in the textbook language, mm -hmm. what he thinks about me when well, I was driving, you know, so it all did not contribute well to my mental uh, well status. So I start feeling really bad. I you went into a depression, in fact, didn't you? I, I do not know what, what it was because all doctors told me that I am perfectly healthy. But I was laying in the bed and I was able only to read detective stories. I could not do much. And I felt really physically awful. Okay? And then suddenly there was a phone call from Academy of Sciences saying that uh, you need to go to Italy to uh, give lectures uh, on uh, well, astronomy, not inflation. On astronomy to right. citizen of Rome and Turin or whatever. And uh, the status at that time was like that. Uh, you do not go abroad more than once. Mm -hmm. So if you go at uh, once, you're lucky. But then you choose this once. Yeah, okay. And choosing this once to teach astronomy to people in Rome, uh, I said, no, I can't go. I am ill. Well, give us a certificate that you're ill. So I was out of my strength. So I asked Renata, can you please go to uh, institute? She came to Ginsburg, our head of the department, mm -hmm. asked, can you sign a letter that Linda is ill and cannot go abroad? He started laughing. Oh, it's so easy. If he doesn't want to go abroad, he just doesn't go. But he signed it anyway. A few days later, there was a call from another part of Academy of Science saying, well, we received your letter. I understand that you are ill, but today you are ill and tomorrow you are healthy. <laughs> if you cannot go abroad, just say so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And apparently there was something about Russian uh, uh, Italian friendship. So it was completely different line. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they decided that somebody must go. And if I say that I cannot go, then this may be for life. So yeah. it was really worrisome. And I stood from my bed. I went to uh, uh, Hospital of Academy of Sciences, paid for a taxi, which was at that time a financial decision for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, within one day, I got signatures of all doctors certifying that I am absolutely healthy. Usually it would take me like a week and a half to do it. Then I returned back home. I was lying in the bed, really in a bad state and uh, writing some papers which are necessary to get the permission for going abroad. Uh, in the Monday, I paid a taxi again to bring my body there. And then I paid uh, our secretaries to immediately type it. And they typed it to me and they went to all places in our institute to get all required signatures also that I can go abroad, okay? And usually it would took me normal way about a month and a half. Mm -hmm. I did it within a day, okay? Because I was really scared. Yeah. And then seriously, because this is not a joke. Okay? Yeah. And then I gave these documents there and uh, I was recovering at home 
And three days later, there was a call from a different place from Academy of Sciences saying, okay, we'll receive your doc documents, you're going to Italy, but our Italian friends asked that you please provide your, well, text of your talk beforehand so that we can distribute it to our Italian friends and you, they would read it before you give a talk. And I was like really out of my wits. And I asked them, uh, but when should I give it to you? And I said, better tomorrow. <laughs> and I thought, that's just impossible to write a new paper, which is nowhere, <laughs> and to give them all, all, all this tomorrow. But then on the other hand, if I don't do it, I use my once opportunity because for almost a year, I am living with my mouth shut yeah. and now I can send it without any permission. I just give them, they will send it by diplomatic mail. Tomorrow it will be in Italy. Yeah. So I just took my head like that and I start moving like that. Oh. Yeah. And what can I do? What, what, what I can invent within half an hour so that I will print it today, type it today and they send it tomorrow. And within half an hour, I found this eternal chaotic inflation. And I just, well, I don't know where, where it came from. Uh -huh. I just checked how these quantum fluctuations may occasionally throw the field higher, higher with the potential. And then it rolls down as it should, but sometimes the quantum fluctuations push it back again. And in this part of the universe where you jumped again, against all normal laws, like, uh, well, like fish which jumps again uh, the, well, the river, okay, mm -hmm. the water. So sometimes when you jump there, then you are rewarded by exponential expansion of volume. And then you jump again, and in some rear parts of it, you are rewarded again. And it's just like in the economy, some very rich people become more, more rich later. <laughs> the universe which able to jump it is rewarded by, okay. So I was unable to write it uh, this uh, evening, uh, but I just gave them some crap, which was in my, uh, well, <laughs> of some previous lectures, whatever. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, a month later, when I was in Italy, uh, I smuggled with me three new papers, which I've written during this time. Uh -huh. And I published them when I uh, uh, came to Trieste. And that was it. Okay, so, so you're, it's a perfect example of necessity is the mother of invention. You had to, yeah, you had to I would not recommend, I would, would not recommend you trying it at home <laughs> yeah, because no. it's a very uh, damaging experience. Oh, I'm, it must have been tremendous, as you say, it was damaging but wonderful at the same time. You, the stress of that caused you to come up with this idea, and just to, just to clarify it for people once more, the point is that that. If you start with a universe that inflates and that inflation ends, that's fine, that works, and it's finite and you solve the problems and that's chaotic inflation in the sense of, of that mm -hmm. you just, you just you know, every you can start out with a universe which is sufficiently energetic and has enough energy stored in empty space. Most universes may not, but some do and those will inflate and boom. And if you're in one of those universes, you're fine. But then the next stage is to realize that even in that universe, which inflates, eventually that will end. But in some places in that universe, it won't end. It'll it'll get bigger and that'll be very rare, but it's re you're rewarded. So the probability of that happening is very small. But if that region grows exponentially, then you have a small probability times a big volume. And most of the most most of the volume will be those things that have had that very rare thing happen. And then it'll happen again and again and again. And so something which intrinsically seems to be very improbable can become very probable because it's rewarded, as you say, by most of space is still inflating. And in, and in that picture, in what we now call the multiverse, most of, most of space is still inflating. We happen to have lived in a region that stopped so that you and I could have this conversation. But in most of the space in the universe, it's empty space that's cold and and expanding exponentially and that's it what we now call internal inflation and that was the idea that you had I, I, I should say just to be fair 
that very similar ideas uh, about that was indeed in these papers of 82 on uh, new inflation. Yeah. And also especially in the paper by Vilenkin in 83 on new inflation. But it was near the top. Yeah. And this was uh, what, what I, I did was totally illegitimate. Okay, yeah. but yeah, it just near the top. happened to happen. Yeah. And also what was important for me, especially just because if you do something, then try to well to do it to the possible limit. So this process is especially active when you jump higher and higher and higher to the highest heights, and that is like Planckian density. And when you jump there at Planckian density, you induce quantum fluctuations in every other field which was lazily laying yeah. around. You push them in over any barrier which separated the possible states. Uh -huh. So if the universe has any many different possibilities, then these quantum fluctuations push the universe in its different parts and continue pushing it forever in different realizations. So if the universe potentially could be red, white, yellow, whatever, then they're always producing yellow red exponentially large part of the universe so laws of physics uh it's maybe a, a wrong language you may have one unifying law of physics but right. realizations of laws of physics can be different in different parts of the universe and that is something which will just completely blow in my mind after after i after I realized this at that time. So that was everything else. Eternal inflation was interesting, but the possibility that you also have this total freedom, mm -hmm. you know, it's opposite to uh, what many people here may want to have. You want to have some structure and the law, whatever. But when Russians first came to Safeway, they were just well they see too much coffee and they leave safeway without buying anything because <laughs> freedom is too large but uh, for some of us uh this unlimited freedom mm -hmm. or possibility of unlimited freedom once you realize that this possibility from in some theories is possible it is not forbidden it is it is a consequence of simple calculations mm -hmm. uh, then you cannot just get rid of this dream later well it's uh, you know and it's it, it's a, it's something that flies in the face of everything that one learned to be to love about physics i mean i became a physicist as you did i'm sure a, a particle physicist especially and a theoretical yeah. physicist because i wanted to discover why the universe had to be the way it is and the net result of this is the universe doesn't have to be the way it is at all. In fact, most of the time it isn't the way it is. And that that's such a revolutionary and I have to say initially disgusting notion for someone who is brought up yeah. saying, I want to discover like Einstein, I want to discover mm -hmm. the ultimate laws of physics, why the universe must cannot be different to suddenly right. give up that notion to think that the universe can be quite different and still be OK. We just wouldn't be here necessarily yeah. to talk about it is a right. revolutionary and a, and a very a very unpleasant notion uh, uh, initially certainly for some for some well some. for anyone who'd grown up wanting but, it wanting but, to be, but uh, for discover the ultimate law they have one law yeah. and when they are going to what every year you're supposed to go to what there is one person in the ballot okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah so when you have diversity of whom you can elect that is something fresh yeah, so right. <laughs> I would say that this is very encouraging. So you liked it early. Well, as always, well, of course, one loves one own, one's own ideas generally before <laughs> other people do anyway. But you certainly liked it before anyone else. And I and I'm, the notion of, of, of eternal inflation did seem initially interesting, but disgusting initially for many people because of this yeah. notion of what we now call a multiverse. But let me say one thing. It's very important. And I, I have to say, I have to tell you that not that it matters, but I was reading your descriptions in a few recent summaries. And you talk about the fact that we get a multiverse because the field can start out in different places and different regimes and the law and, 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 but, 
and and make it sound like that's why we get a multiverse, but that's not the case at all. That would just cause the transition to be different from place to place. What you need, and you don't say that in your papers, so you can rewrite them. What you need is not just that it starts at different places, but it ends at different places. And I and I yeah, I found that a little confusing in in, in when you wrote because yeah. and you have to you, because that's the key point is that the final yeah. state is different, not that the initial state is different, but the final. So state your, your theory must allow you. This yeah, because if it always, if there's one single state it can end up, it doesn't matter where you start from, you always end up at the same place. Well, there is a trick about that. There is a trick. The trick is that when you are talking about the multiverse, uh, of course, when you just go to this everything, everywhere, all at once, they have their own idea what multiverse is. Yeah. Okay, so everyone has its own uh, understanding. Uh, there is one which is less revolutionary. Uh, and uh, this one, I probably everybody would buy. And after uh, you buy it, then you're already trapped. Okay, <laughs> so here it is. Yes, we uh, know that now that after Planck, after the theory of, uh, well, galaxy formation from quantum fluctuations, okay, we know that we have right now this mechanism of production of large scale structure of the universe. And for a while, it was one of the many mechanisms. Like, for example, there was a cosmic strings, uh, textures, etc. After so many years, none of this mechanism alone was able to explain the observable structure of the universe. So either you are in inflationary theory, or you are now with any of its competitors, uh, chaotic, uh, well, uh, cyclic, uh, perotic, uh, we'll whatever. Talk about some of those later. Yeah, mm -hmm. whatever. In all of these uh, models, you always use the principle that large scale structure was produced by quantum mutations. Yeah. Once you say so, you sold your, uh, well, uh, sold to a devil. <laughs> because what does it mean, really? And I formulated it in a tricky way. You know, starting from, uh, well, the origin of quantum mechanics, you have this famous schrodinger cat paradox. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay? So cat end up either dead or alive, but probabilistically so. Yeah. Okay? So uh, people even now debate and hate each other in debating whether the cat is really dead or really alive before the wave function of the cat is reduced by an external observer, or maybe it's a multiverse interpretation saying that one cat is dead in this universe and it's a well, twin cat originally uh, is right now in another parallel universe, whatever. So all of this was about the cat which existed there and the whole debate is about whether the cat can, what's the real, who is the killer? Who opened the cage? Maybe, because mm -hmm. we, before uh, you observe it, the cat is not registered dead. So all of this was uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. So what happened with galaxies? It's like the cat, which was not there. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, there was no cat. There was no galaxies. Mm -hmm. It's not that the galaxy is here and galaxy can be different. Okay, mm -hmm. It's a no galaxy. Because it's quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, you may start with a state without any particles. We go to state with many particles. Okay, So we start with a state with no cat. We get a state with a cat. And after that, cat is either dead or alive. We start with a state without any galaxies, and you get the galaxies. But because galaxies right now is children of quantum fluctuations, galaxy can stay uh, another galaxy to the right of you or to the left of you or in this part of the sky or in this part of the sky. It's quantum mechanical chances. Yes. Okay? So then when you produce the universe and the universe continues self-reproducing, okay, then you produce all possible combinations of galaxies in the sky. This is already a multiverse. So mm -hmm. if you are born in a different part of the universe, you have completely different sets on the galaxies on the sky. Mm -hmm. And if you travel all across the multiverse, if it were possible, which is practically not, okay, mm -hmm. 
but if you will just imagine the traveling, then you see inside the same thing, produce it from one speck of space, one, well, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters long, you produce all distributions of galaxies of all possible type, taking all possible states in the sky, every possibility exists somewhere, okay? So that's a multiverse, we like it or not. It, this yeah. is a property of every theory. I mean, when people from community who hates inflation mm -hmm. say something hateful about multiverse, they ignore the fact that they have the same story. And if in their models, they have many vacua, string theory vacua, they have multiverse in their own room. Okay, so, so what, what happens is that people do not understand that when a genie is out of the bottle, it is very difficult to put it back. You cannot just say because you don't like the idea. You may hate it. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely understand the haters because it would be great to have one unique explanation. But yeah. you know what? Uh, I like what Gilman said about that. He said in a reply, maybe, maybe he said it in a different context, but I read it like a consequence sequence from Einstein to Gelman. Mm -hmm. Einstein wanted to find why only these coupling constants are possible. And Gelman said, uh, Gelman Hartley, uh, they said that some things are fundamental and some things are environmental. So if you have the same fundamental theory with a set of fundamental constants, but realizations, it's just like water can be frozen, a liquid and vapor, the same water. So you have the same fundamental truth, but it has different realization than in different environments. It is realized differently. And there was something, some things which we previously realized, uh, assumed to be constant, fundamental constant. They're just environmental. In this environment, this is what you see. In this environment, in some environment, fish can flow, but it cannot flow, uh, it cannot live in ice. So that is something on cosmic scale that is pretty interesting. Yeah, no, in fact, I, I, I think I've, I don't know, I didn't hear it from Gelman, but I first heard, that indeed, if the multiverse is true, then physics becomes an environmental science. Yeah. Not a fundamental science. Some people don't like that, you know, we do fundamental physics. They don't think of it as fundamental. And fundamental physics becomes environmental science, as you say. It's just uh, we're here because of an environmental accident. If 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 there's a multiverse and if if the laws of physics are different in the different regions. And I should say, before we, I want to get to the multiverse as we get near the end here, but I wanna I I I should say that that um um uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> that um, <laughs> there's so many things I want to get to. That um, that if there is a multiverse, um, then that the, the oh now I remember what I was going to say that many people talk about different kinds of multiverses and the public gets confused because in string theory there's many dimensions and there could be a multiverse in the sense that our mere four dimensional universe can be one part of a highly much bigger dimensional space and there could be another universe a millimeter away or less than that in some extra dimension and blah 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 but let me say this and maybe we you, i assume you'll agree when people ask me about a multiverse i say there's only one well motivated multiverse and for me that's the multiverse from inflation no extra dimensions no physics that we don't know about it's the physics that we can understand in a four-dimensional universe that if there's inflation you almost inevitably end up with a multiverse. So I don't bother talking about extra dimensions because it's too confusing and also very speculative. If if inflation happened, there's a well motive then then that's the one well motivated multiverse, and that's the one yeah. multiverse that gives us this possibility, weird possibility that the laws of physics could be different in each possible universe, which I yeah. want to get to because that leads to a whole bunch of well, it leads to a different world, but. Um, in a different way of thinking. I was going to say that the perestroika that also allowed you to get to Italy, there's two things I want to get to before that. One is it allowed you to get to Italy, but eventually it allowed you to get to the United States. In 1989, you spent a year at CERN. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, you decided not to go. Look, 
I was around at the time, and it was clear to me that many of the best Russian scientists were leaving the moment they had an opportunity to do so. Princeton snapped up a whole bunch, and 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 um, and some stayed. Um, uh, Valery Rubikov stayed. I, 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 let me say, but but um, what was the decision that caused you and 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 Renata to to decide in 1990 to not go back to so, to Russia, but to but to but to move to Stanford, if you want to talk about it. If you don't, it's fine. Um, I, I think uh, things happen sometimes unexpectedly um, for each of us. I, I was absolutely sure that I'm going to return back. I had a very bad but still running car. So I oiled it and I put it to uh, well, uh, my father's garage uh, so that uh, I was able to, that when I return, it will be still in existence. Okay. Uh, we had an apartment. Uh, I had my mother and father living there at that time. Renata's mother, unfortunately, passed away at that time. So uh, uh, when we appeared at CERN, uh, you know, you usually in our practice, we previously would come like only one of us, okay? Without children, uh, you do not have any real option uh, to stay there unless you uh, want to get rid of your family and everything. Mm -hmm. okay. But so this was the first time when they allowed us to come for a year with the family. And then when we came there, they suddenly at CERN uh, start talking with me about staying there maybe forever. Then uh, some people from US came up to CERN suggesting me and Renata to get professor positions uh, in Minnesota University. I was flying there and they explained me how life is good there, et cetera, et cetera. And they explained me what will be my salary there and Renata's. And I looked at them and I say, no, uh, first of all, uh, all salary above $2,500, I must return back to Academy of Sciences. <laughs> so it was still not real. Uh -huh. And second, well, just imagine what I'm going to do with the money like that. <laughs> and they told me, yes, but it is still a position in society. And I did not tell them, but I thought what I'm going to do <laughs> with <laughs> whatever. So it was not real. Uh, but gradually, uh, these things start accumulating. And uh, when you start understanding that this is now maybe real, mm -hmm. and my children attending international school in Geneva, uh -huh. and they're doing well, and they're doing well in English, and my uh, older one is all the time at CERN, CERN theory division explaining mm -hmm. me how to uh, use Apple Macintosh computer because he knew it instantly and he was so agitated and he said, it's so beautiful. I said, what? And then it took me some time to understand and I'm still using Apple's only. Yeah, I remember you yeah. used it early on, Apple too, and then, and then so, yeah, we both did. So, yeah. so things like that, they happen gradually and then uh, you see that what you previously consider like a barrier, it may be a soft transition and you may not make any final decisions. And well, and so yeah. that's yeah. how it is. So, and, you're like, so you, you know, you had a smooth transition life. that could have been chaotic and you, you could have gone back. Yeah. Like it, inflation. It, it, it could be, but also because uh, our previous life as I said, with these visits to Sakharov, et cetera, and everything um, made us uh, not very uh, well against the possibility to uh, to stay around here. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so that was like that. Okay, so it was no big, it was sort of an ev uh, evolving realization that a different life could be quite good, just like an evolving realization that a multiple universes could be quite good. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then, and you were in Stanford instead of in a different universe, you could have been in, in Russia, but, uh, uh, and Lenny Saskin, Lenny Saskin was totally great. Yeah. 
Now, I want to go back to this multiple universe, but I wanted to get to the point. You're now at Stanford and how you got there. And I always wondered about that, whether it was an obvious decision or whether it, it uh, came out. You did say something which I do want to go back to before we get to the multiverse, because one of the important things about inflation is it's not just a great idea in different ways, but it actually can be tested in other ways, maybe not unambiguously tested. And that's been a big debate. But one of the points you mentioned was that if you have enough energy, you get excitations in all fields. And I first learned this, for, uh, not only just in, in the regular stuff, but you get excitations in gravity. And I think the first person to realize that, at least I learned it was from Rubikov, from a paper from Rubikov I learned in 1982 when I was at Harvard. And I remember no one else seemed to have read that paper, or at least, and, and I remember telling uh, my friends at that time, uh, my colleague Mark Wise and Larry Abbott, who was nearby, they were working on things. And I said, no, no you're doing it wrong. This, this paper by Rubikov shows that you get fluctuations in gravity and you'd get gravitational waves as well as all the other stuff. And, and did it first. What was that? Stravinsky did it in 78. Okay, Stravinsky maybe did it first, but I learned it from Rubikov. And, yeah, I know. Um, I know. and, and it, it imprinted on me. And I will say that if one area where I think that important fact that, that gravitational waves that come from inflation did not seem to be something that was on that was percolating in the community and i will give i remember when in when the when the co, when the colby when the causing microwave background fluctuations were first discovered in 1992 and everyone already said oh look these are quantum fluctuations from in in matter fields that could be due to inflation and yes i i i said well what about gravity waves and i worked with then my student um then Martin White, White, who's now at, at Berkeley. Right. Um, and I said, you know what? It's, if, it, if scale of inflation is high enough, you could produce gravitational waves. And, this, and all that Colby ever discovered was this thing called a quadrupole anisotropy. Yeah. He said, maybe that's just gravity waves. And we wrote a paper. And then, and, but what, what's really been important is to realize that, that while many, many theories may predict a, different fluctuations, one of the things that inflation inevitably does is predict gravity waves. And if you could see them, that would kind of be an unambiguous test of inflation. And, 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 and people started to seek out and look for them. And it was realized that one way to get them would be looking at something called a polarization in the microwave background. And you know, and I know this wonderful day when it looked like yeah. it was accidentally discovered. I remember yeah. the video of seeing you being <laughs> met at the door with a, bottle of champagne and all the rest but 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 this could be uh could be a smoking gun that would be a sort of an unambiguous um demonstration that inflation happened but nevertheless the other predictions of inflation a spectrum of fluctuations which seems to match beautifully with the cosmic microwave background super horizon size correlations because inflation stretches yes. things all yeah. of these things have been observed already yeah. yeah um and i wanted to ask you do you do you kind of feel like inflation even in the absence of of gravitational waves is sort of unambiguously sh been shown to exist or do, or or what do we need to do before we convince the world other than you and maybe me and others that inflation happened well um uh just like with this transition from one country to another, uh, transitions happen uh, gradually and you become more convinced on the way. Uh, so for me, there were several uh, moments in these 40 years of my life with inflation where, which were like near-death near death experience. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the first one actually was very early. So in uh, 83 or 84, Igor Novikov came to us and said that we expect to have fluctuations of density necessary for producing galaxies at the level 10 to the minus 3. Mm -hmm. And we do not see them. And uh, adiabatic perturbations of this type would be, well, just observable. Yeah. And uh, so inflation cannot work. But then later, many years later, we realized that uh, actually, if you take into account dark matter, you don't need 10 to the minus 3. 
Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was one thing. But for me at that time, I did not realize that this is near-death experience, but nevertheless. So we were saved by dark matter who mm -hmm. ordered it, okay? Then in uh, 95, 90, whatever, these years, everybody knew that uh, the universe is not flat because omega is 0.3, okay? And then I'm coming to a conference in UCLA in 98, and they announce that you have right now a cosmological constant of dark energy, which just feeds the bill. Okay, some, so of us, we, some of us argued that had to be the case beforehand, as you know, in 95. Right, yeah. right. But nevertheless, when yeah. it is announced, and I call Renata to say, tell her about that. Uh -huh. And she is at uh, that time in, uh, 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 oh my God, he, this is 75 years old. <laughs> uh, uh, my God. What is wrong with me? <laughs> uh, the place between uh, Stanford and Los Angeles, where this institute. Oh, in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara? Yes. The KITP in Santa Barbara. Is, I still remember what an eternal inflation is about. I do not remember. <laughs> what it's... Well, you remember the important things. <laughs> okay, right. That's how Einstein tried to force himself to forget the spirit of sound. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, uh, Anyway, so uh, I, I'm calling, she was just exactly at the conference there. I explained, mm -hmm. told, told her about that. She was excited. Uh, next day, I calling her again, and she said, you know what? I had a discussion with David Gross. And David Gross told her, oh, Renata, I'm so sorry that inflation right now is finally ruled out. <laughs> and you know, to say, why? Well, because I just returned from the conference in Princeton, where they finally well, all insist that omega is equal to 0.3, and this is not what inflation predicts, and therefore inflation, sorry to say, it's finally ruled out. Yeah. And then I, I not told him, yeah, but Andre just called from UCLA and told that they found this dark energy, so right now everything, no, I came from a real conference <laughs> in Princeton, <laughs> not UCLA. <laughs> and they said that Omega is equal to 0.3. <laughs> Next day, all walls in his institute were covered by newspapers announcing it. So this was another near-death experience. Near experience yes. It was possible to have, I myself invent some models of inflation with omega not i remember you did yeah but they were all admittedly extremely ugly and only some ugliest or ugliest of them still exist i mean still yeah. possible and yeah. i i'm telling it uh, without offending anybody because the ugliest was mine yeah. it worked okay mm -hmm. but it was absolutely ugliest it was unbelievably ugly okay and well so we now, there was another ex experience in 2012, approximately, mm -hmm. when everybody started spreading the rumors that uh, quantum fluctu or the fluctuations produced at inflation. Um, um, WMAP is going to announce soon there will be a conference in, the, in summer, maybe 12, 2012. Uh, the WMAP is going to announce finding this large FNL all postdoc and students, everyone it was inventing a new, better theory with large non-Gaussianity because they learned, everybody started uh, learning, that if some specific type of non-Gaussianity, which for the listeners is that normal situation would be that you have normal coins, okay? Not mm -hmm. bent coins. Mm -hmm. okay. so if somebody is bending coins in inflationary cosmology, you would not like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we expected that it was announced. Paul Steinhardt, in uh, his talk lecture given at Perimeter Institute, said that inflation cannot predict anything, but one thing that it really predicts is that uh, there will be uh, uh, no uh, very small uh, FNL. And our, uh, yeah, our periodic theory predicts 
unlike inflation, yeah. that is about maybe 30. And then finally, there was this data from Planck, and I, at that time, was uh, in uh, Europe boarding the airplane uh, returning back to Stanford. I was standing near the airplane with uh, Renata's iPhone because at that time I did not have mine. <laughs> and he, she called me from some other <laughs> not iPhone source <laughs> and told me, uh, Planck just make an announcement, made an announcement and no non Gaussianity. This was the one thing which he told me, okay? Uh -huh. So I downloaded everything on my iPhone I was reading on, on in flight. That was it, okay? No, uh, no, 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 no observable non Gaussianity. Another near death experience because it would rule out practically all single field inflationary models. Mm -hmm. So this will be not a kill, mm -hmm. okay? But it would kill uh, like almost every other model which we paid our attention to. Mm -hmm. So these kind of stories, uh, they were repeated and repeated and repeated when you have more 10 of them and I have a list of 10. Yeah. Then you say, do you really need to uh, see, to hear 11th one? Okay. Uh, but I would say that, of course, if you can get gravitational waves, it would be great. It would be, I mean, it would be, yeah, obviously not just because I was, I've written about them, but they would be really, actually, it'd be great for another reason, oh, yes. which I think you know of. Well, not for me, there's two things. I think you, in one of your things I was reading recently, you say, and a lot of people point out if there's a multiverse, we'll never know about it. But if we could detect gravitational waves, and if that would tell us in detail about the inflationary model, and then you could look at the model and say, does it imply a multiverse? And then you'd have an excellent indirect evidence of other universes. And I argued, in fact, in my new book, that that's not that different than atoms. You know, people believed in atoms long before you could ever see one. And happily, yeah. you could see one. But they used to say we'd never be able to see an individual atom. But yeah. it didn't stop us from realizing that all the indirect arguments told us that atoms existed. This may yeah. not be as strong, but if you could measure gravitational waves, and therefore to measure the parameters of inflation, you'd be able to indirectly say other universes must exist even though we'll never never see them. I find that, fa I, for me, I find that heartening. I, I, I think it's unlike, you know, even if it's unlikely we'll ever see them, the possibility is a beautiful one, I think. Yeah, uh, my, my own attitude to that was uh, changing in time. Uh, definitely when there was a splash with bicep, yeah, so it was very exciting, and it was nice to believe it for a while. Yeah. Um, well, when uh, this team came to my house I uh, with, uh, with champagne and whatever, I asked them first, but oh, how did you do it? Like, you are looking at this part of the sky. Are you sure that this is not astrophysics? Mm -hmm. Because this is like, this is a small part of it. And they told no, we studied everything which okay, so what I respect them enormously. Uh, whatever Me too, they, actually. I they, mean, I was... they are right now still the champions in this area. The the latest well papers uh give the greatest constraint on art available at the moment. Sure. So I mean they were just bad luck. I mean they did everything right. I I physical review asked me to write the companion paper to explain it and and it, you know, it just happened to be they were looking at the wrong part of the sky. If they'd looked at another part, they wouldn't have seen that signal. And who knew, who knew at the time that the signal they thought was gravitational waves was actually astrophysics? Yeah. There was no really good reason to do that. And so, yeah, they got in a bad rap. I, I think they did it. They did everything right. But unfortunately, just an accident of uh, it was environmental science. They picked the wrong environment to look for that signal. But the other thing, by the way, that that I think we've talked about, but I, I, that I, fascinates me. The wonderful thing, if we could detect gravitational waves from inflation, as you know, my, my colleague Frank Bolchek and I produced a paper showing that one of the big questions in modern physics is, is gravity a quantum theory? Yeah. And, and if, if you could see gravitational waves from inflation, you'd be able to prove it, which to me is a remarkable thing. You'd be able to prove that gravity is a quantum theory. All of us expect it is. But but some people say maybe it isn't. Maybe it's quantum mechanics that you have to give up at some fundamental scale, and so this would this this would resolve that. So it would be a triple triple 
score if you could ever detect gravitational waves from inflation, although it's a long shot. I remember that when we discussed this thing with Muhammad, this argument, yeah. he insisted that if you do really consistent, detailed theory of uh, adiabatic perturbations, and he knows because he was the author of that, yeah. but also later on, he was the first person who really did uh, theory, well, developed the theory of perturbations and chaotic inflation in general, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. So he said that if you do it very carefully, then you will see that there are variables in which you express your answer and this variable simultaneously involve uh, so that you cannot unpack scale field at gravitational uh, field. Yeah. So evidence of quantum gravity already is there. But I totally agree that uh, if you have gravitational waves, that would be cleaner thing. Yeah, it would be cleaner. When we showed it on, on dimensional analysis grounds. It shocked me when we could show it. So it'd be lovely, and we'll we'll hope. And if it and if they're discovered, I'll come to your house with champagne. But but <laughs> uh, but let's. I want to conclude with the the multiverse. Well, two thip aspects of the multiverse. You know, the multiverse gets a bad rap from creationists because they say it's like God. We're just saying, well, you know, we can't explain why the world is except except that if it were different, we wouldn't be able to be here to explain it. And this anthropic argument is kind of slimy, but maybe true. And, 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 and I think Steven Weinberg was the first one to really, in my mind, make it clear that it was, whether we like it or not, it, it may be true. And uh, inflation gives a landscape with string theory, but even without string theory, inflation gives a potential landscape to explain that what we see, that our universe we live in may just be an accident. And and the pro and certain properties like this very small value for the vacuum energy, which we call a cosmological constant, which seems no one of none of us can explain from fundamental principles, even though we've tried, um, uh, could just be an accident of our circumstances. And um, but but I want to push back because we've had this discussion. I remember at a th conference in yeah in 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 France when I was a. I like to be a devil's advocate if I can be, and 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 you and Alan and Vil and Vilenkin, all the tr all the all the proponents of the of of anthropic principle and 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 I I still think it, it's it, it's it, the argument is that the only way to understand a cosmological constant this weird value of. of of the of vacuum of energy of the universe is with the multiverse, and it certainly is the best argument. But but this argument that 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 you can't could only have life in a universe that has a small that we'd only be here in a universe that has a small cosmos. That argument I don't think holds water. And you agree with me now? I think I mean you because we don't know. It all depends. It all assumes that we are typical. That we're. But I like Star Trek. And I've already well, seen that we may not be typical. Define, define we. Okay, let, let, let me explain what I mean. Uh, the, there is a uh, there are several different ways of uh, understanding anthropic principle, mm -hmm. and I may tell you that until I've seen how it is realizable in uh, chaotic inflation, I myself would just say that this is garbage. This is just like that. Okay, well. But uh, one possible uh, interpretation, which I like, is a correlation, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, correlation between you and the part of the universe where you can live. But if you have, for example, artificial intelligence based on a completely different type of uh, machines, whatever, and you call it life, and this life does not require your oxygen and uh, carbon, whatever. You can live without stars producing oxygen and, and carbon. So many, many constraints, uh, anthropic constraints appearing there would be totally invalid. Yes. And uh, then the issue will be then between this kind of intelligence and its environment, the correlation allows for them to live in a different environment. And at the moment when you say 
that parts of physics at least are environmental, then you say, what I'm studying is my environment. And my environment must be consistent with me being possible to observe it. And there is nothing chauvinistic about it, like we are the best and the only. Okay, so it's usually uh, anthropic was unlike these animals. Okay, no, mm. uh, unlike bacteria. Oh no, but there are so much more bacteria than mm. men. Yeah. It, so yeah. I said, well, so that's how it is. So uh, uh, as as long as you have some sense of humor and understand uh, limitations of language in this and be careful in not saying nonsense but really talking about correlations then you are not uh, offending any sensibilities i hope uh, there is a correlation between me and not being able to live in inside the ocean okay yeah. i cannot yeah exactly but i think that's fine but the question is yeah the bottom line i, I guess is I don't. Th I think it it allows the possibility, but not the proof. I guess is what I'm saying is that yes. is that it certainly makes it possible. But it could be that most universes have life that's quite different than us. It still makes us small probability. It doesn't mean it's most likely that we're here. We're here, and if yeah. there are an infinite number of universes, then the universe that allows us to be here will will be here, and we'll find ourselves in that universe, and it's not too surprising. But yeah. the big problem, I think you'll agree with me is we don't understand the possibilities for life. We don't understand the underlying, if you want to call it phase space. And when you have infinities, talking about probability tends to be often a matter of, um, of beauty in the eye of the beholder rather than, well, you know, rather than good mathematics. When you have infinities, you can come up with all sorts of arguments. Uh, the, this is correct, okay. And it is correct mathematically, mm -hmm. and it is correct also with respect to our own position in the universe, because we may be conditioned to think that the we are, well, here we are, and we are the most intelligent people so far until this chat GPT for <laughs> appeared, whatever, in the existence, therefore must be very special, and therefore we must understand the property of the space where such a grandiose uh, well thinkers like we are may exist okay but that's an arrogant attitude if you however make it more modest and say that i just want to study given that i first know something about myself given that i know that i need carbon and oxygen and I need, well, the planetary systems, which are relatively stable, all of these things, then what kind of other properties of our universe are necessary for that? And if I find that some of the properties can be different uh, and one, some fit to our existence, I say, okay, at least I do not have a headache with this aspect. Yeah. I yeah. will try to solve other problems. Yeah, because there are many problems which cannot be solved this way. Yeah, okay, that's why. So it's I will then. So I I will nevertheless sometimes start thinking, what if I do it differently? Okay, yeah. and that's what we are doing. So you cannot forbid us to find a better, easier, more universal solution, which mm -hmm. may eventually occur to us. Just like well, all of this years of strange discoveries teach us that mm -hmm. sometimes you do not expect it and something which is well believed to be forbidden actually is okay well yeah. so so i would not make any strong bets i'm just saying that one thing about uh this that if we do not uh, really say that we must understand what is the best universally for everyone the best place in the universe to live and why it is most probable for everyone to live there i think that this is stupid okay okay good. but if okay. we say for us then we can use this as a part of our data okay uh, taking ourselves as a part of data another thing about probability in general if i have infinite uh, uh box of oranges and infinite uh, box of uh, apples and 
who I am to say which one is bigger. Yeah. So uh, um, I would say that there are two parts of it. The first is about eternal inflation. Honestly, there could be some hidden problem in calculations which we do not recognize because, well, we just all started doing it. We do not see anything stupid in it. The calculations are, seem to be right, but maybe there are some conceptually incorrect. Second, there may be no string once K, but a swamp one. Oops, sorry. There is no consistent uh, theory of dark energy so far with this one one. Or, or if you have one, then probably in string theory, you have di many different theories. So, okay, everything again. So we do not know what happens really there. And can we really have this multiplicity? It's just all string theory is like that, but who knows what will be the real theory is. It's interesting, nevertheless, to explore this possibility that you have this landscape but if you are trying if you just say that this is possible yeah like in 93 we developed some special with two different measures of probability in the landscape yeah, yeah but we would be we were careful playing with this because we simultaneously was played with both and explaining look here we we clearly see that it is not sufficient for us to predict anything one of them we cut the universe in the slices of a given time coming in time with us yeah in another we use time like a degree of expansion of the universe uh -huh. and these two different times so they are all legitimate in general theory of relativity they give two different answers so clearly we are doing something wrong okay now uh, people who uh, you want to say something bad about inflation they're welcome to use one of these two measures because we invented two okay one of these measures lead to completely idiotic predictions and Tegmark found it in 2004 that we must be then most probably there's a strong youngness, par, par, youngness paradox showing that we must live in the hot universe now yeah. around, around us the hotter the better okay yeah um, and uh, uh, with the second measure it will not be that but maybe there will be some problems some people love it uh, in 2007, though, I realized that maybe there is a way of making peace with both of them. If instead of cutting them like that, you sort them by processes. Because the the way how we sort it, sorry if I am going too much in the garble, whatever, for everyone. But we are trying to order these infinities. Okay? Yes. So we're trying to sort them by cutting the different and then we found that the probability distribution becomes stationary with respect to time so if we say that in this section red and green universes like uh, one to ten then in the next section it will be also one to ten and this was very convincing for us that we are talking something clever but then i understood that it is slightly dishonest and dishonesty was hidden, so it took me like 15 years to realize it. Uh, and what happens is that when we are talking, it's just like with simultaneity in, in special yeah. theory of relativity, which I learned, mm -hmm. learned in my car, okay? So uh, it looks like an obvious concept, but one should be careful sometimes, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the same thing with this cutting. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the tree is growing and produce you apples and another tree grows and produce you oranges but the orange tree takes more years to start producing oranges mm -hmm. so you do not cut the trees at 10 years after they grown and compare how many oranges okay because when they approach the stationary regime yeah then they will continue starting producing this same amount of uh, as oranges and apples. but you must start counting time from the moment when each of them approaches maturity when the uh, yeah. trees start producing oranges what we were doing we were cutting trees mm -hmm. without any fruits and we're cutting fruits later so it was it, okay so what i found that if you start measuring it 
at the times corresponding for each process at the beginning of when the moment when this process becomes stationary, then suddenly the results do not depend on cutting, don't depend on the time which I'm using. And all of this youngness paradox in Boltzmann brains, they just disappear. Uh, but not many people know about this. Well, look, I think, likes I, think, I think, as you point out, the, 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 the subtleties of this discussion are probably yeah. beyond people. But what I think they, they point out is that the edge, at the edge of knowledge, which I have to say is the title of my new book, um, there's lots of there's lots of things we don't fully understand. And and the multiverse opens up a lot of things which which we're trying to understand. And sometimes statements are made that are a little too strong. And I think I, I'm happy that you and I both agree that what allows us to, it allows something to be possible, but proofs of things are very difficult when you don't have an underlying theory. You can look for plausibility, you can look for possibility, and there's a difference between possibility and plausibility. And we, there are still big arguments between different people, sometimes between me and you, on what's plausible and what's possible. Um, but it allows, but this possibility that there's many universes opens up a vast new way of thinking about nature that is, is still uncertain. And, uh, and the principle called the anthropic principle is largely a principle of ignorance rather than knowledge. And hopefully yeah. when we learn more about the underlying theories, we'll be able to, we'll be able to see which of these arguments are really worth trusting and which aren't. And, and, and it's exciting. And, and I think, as I say, what's really for me, the most fascinating thing is inflation gives you a physical reason why we should have these discussions. When people say, and I've often debated religious people who say, well, for the multiverse is just your way of replacing God. And, 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 and I say, no, that we were, the reason the difference is that we didn't invent the multiverse to solve the problem. We were driven to it. Most of us didn't want it. And it happens to be a way that we may, that well, like it or not, it may be the way nature is. And we weren't, we didn't invent it because we loved it. We were driven to it and inflation drove us to it. And I don't think anyone, you as much as anyone would have liked the multiverse 40 years ago. It came out of the equations rather than being put in. I know that um, you said that when you grew up in, in the Soviet Union, that religion was suppressed and it was kind of depressing for you to go back and see how religion has taken over so much of the of Russia. Um, maybe you maybe you want to comment on that briefly. Uh, well, it just it. It seems to me that there are so many great ideas uh, in uh, uh, in culture of every religion, uh, but then uh, there were also lots of evil associated with uh, well making uh, some statements of uh, associated with this religion too close to the heart. So it's it's a dangerous game, and if we Previously, uh, at least in Russia, we were all conditioned that you should not uh, talk about nonsense, okay? And then the pendulum swings, and then suddenly you, you feel yourself in a completely different environment. Uh, the bad thing about it is to depend on pendulum swinging. Uh, the best thing you can do is kind of dissociate yourself from the pendulum and think yourself and then whoever comes with a better conclusion maybe it will be like that i remember how i came with this uh well city with the name santa barbara which i cannot remember <laughs> okay at the conference uh where several really brilliant people will gather it soon after the discovery of string theory landscape and Kiki yeah. the story. And some of them asked me, so what do you think about this uh, string theory landscape? And I say, it's just great. And let us start explaining and, and how I like this and how I like this. And one of them, a uh, well-meaning person, looked at me and say, what point like that is, and you are the worst. And I said, oh, then this means that I'm 
telling something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who knows? Who it knows? I think the weird. idea. I think your idea of not depending on the pendulum, whether it's religion or fads in physics, but think for yourself is a is a good is a good motto, and it would be a wonderful way to end. Except I'm going to ask you one other question. Okay. Because I want to give you a chance to respond. You know, I talked to we and Alan Guth right after I talked to Roger Penrose, and you know, the biggest critic of inflation is Roger Penrose. And 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 I will say, I reminded. Let me let me let me phrase this. One of the things you point out, besides the fact, at the same time as you talk about, I know you've talked about the fact that the universe can come from nothing, something we both agree with, and 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 as I say, has been good for both of us. But you point out that the interesting thing is that normally. Order in 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 it, when we normally think of physics, order turns into chaos. It's called thermodynamics. And what what inflation does is starts with chaos and turns it into order, in a sense. And that sounds very suspicious. It sounds like it violates the result, laws of thermodynamics. And it, and I think it's what has driven Roger Penrose to argue there's something fishy here. So what I'd like to give you the final chance is to say why his objections in some sense he would say that embedded in your equations even though even though improbable regions grow exponentially fast somehow there's an inherent improbability and the end result uh, that we're assuming is incredibly improbable and it has to do with thermodynamics and he would argue this, and I want you to give you your car. I want to give you a chance. I've given Alan a chance, but I'd like to give you a chance to counter Roger's argument here. Well, if you want. Maybe I should say first a general uh, thing. I am very much afraid that when I will grow older, and I already did, I will make judgment on different fields in which I cannot work because it takes so much time for me to learn new things already. And when you uh, are getting older, you still remember some names uh, <laughs> stuff. Uh, but learning new things, participating in new developments becoming increasingly more complicated. And therefore, there is an easy way out. And that is to assume that these other fields uh, uh, somehow uh, are wrong and not interesting. And I remember discussing it with Roger a long time ago, well, uh, when I was still in Moscow. And already at this time, he was at this stage. He, uh, he is absolutely brilliant. His works on mathematics and on cosmology, they're fabulous. They uh, uh, when I was a student, I was learning uh, all, all about that. But at some moment, he uh, will start making statements concerning everything. And uh, it is really necessary to uh, jump inside, work there, and then maybe learn the new way of thinking. So I'm afraid right now, uh, already I'm close to this state, and I'm looking what others are doing and I say, no, uh, physics is in crisis, whatever. So I'm very, very much afraid of myself uh, to go to the state prematurely. But returning to that, one of the things which come natural to well, people of a generation which came before inflation and did not learn the new set of ideas is that you have these particles existing in the universe, like protons, okay? And they probably, something like that, maybe exist before the singularity, and then they came uh, out of the singularity, maybe, or whatever it is, but you already have them. You have them ten to the... Uh, 88 protons mm -hmm. in the part of no 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 much much less mm -hmm. <laughs> okay now you see uh, it's photons 10 to the 88 yeah, yeah, right yeah yeah okay and so uh we did not learn not about inflation but we didn't learn or well, some didn't learn that the protons 
could not maybe even exist when the universe was just born yeah. because their number is not conserved. Yeah. So our preconceptions of what is most natural for the universe, there was something there which existed. So this idea that there was something there, it is possible, but then write your theory, okay? And yeah. then write your theory and show how this something yeah. went through the singularity and appeared there. We yeah. cannot do it even with a black hole, okay? Yeah. You throw the chair uh, in the black hole, we do not expect that the chair will appear from the black uh -huh. hole. You yeah. get some noise. We go to the cosmological singularity, the universe crashes to the singularity, and you uh, accept, uh, well, is expect the same universe to re-emerge there with all the same entropy and everything. That's kind of interesting, but you come with a theory. But if you do not have this description, then let's just uh, limit ourselves to something simpler, even just reduce the level of uh, being pretentious that we are close to God who tell us the last piece of knowledge. Forget even about eternal inflation and stuff. Though. You want to explain what happens later, like already long after eternal inflation is ended, etc. Let's make a Minor, minor, tiny assumption that for whatever reason, scale of field in the, this part of the universe, well, it was still more than 60 foldings for the universe to grow, was in this state. Can we make a reliable prediction? Yeah, I can. Does this reliable prediction really depend on what happened in uh, 10 previous foldings? No, not much so. Can you studying the present state of the universe really go back to the singularity? Well, I can prove that you cannot, okay? Because, and then you go back uh, to the universe, well, taking our part of the universe and smashing it back 60 foldings and smashing it back another 20 foldings or so. And then all structures which exist right now become sub -planking. Mm -hmm. There is no memory of what is happening there. You cannot see the singularity because mm -hmm. our measuring tools do not allow us. So suppose you do not know anything about the singularity. What we know, however, if we make some assumptions about what happened later in a peaceful part of this evolution, you can make unambiguous predictions in our part of the universe. If we feed the data, great. Does not uh, well, does not disallow us to speculate about the origin of everything, because if you have the picture of everything, so the greater. Okay? Yeah. So we will we are going to continue doing this because it's most exciting. You don't want to die without knowing everything. <laughs> well, uh, what can I say? Probably this dream will not be uh, satisfied, uh, at least in this life. We, I, I would say be to i would say amen to that in a different way as i've often said if if the, as Feynman would say if the universe is like an onion and you keep peeling back and each time there are an infinite number of layers it's not bad because what it does is it gives us cosmic job security because if we knew everything then we could just we, then we wouldn't need to then we'd have to pack up our books and go home and i think as long as we realize there's probably more to learn it's exciting and it gives something for young people um some motivation. And that's why, in fact, I would argue that not knowing, which is one of the properties that drives us all as scientists, is the I joy wonder, of not knowing and the hope that we'll discover something who, we knew that we didn't know before. This artificial intelligence with this goal of acquiring more and more intelligence. That's well, so interesting. Look, yeah. look let, all I can say is <laughs> I, I think there's some wonderful morals to end this with. Or, uh, moral, yeah, morals and uh, as in the morals of a story, not the morals of what we should do and what we shouldn't yeah. do. The the one is that near death experiences, things that make us very uncomfortable, are not always so bad, and sometimes they can lead to really good things. The other is not to be governed by the swing of a pendulum, <laughs> but to think for yourself. And the third is to be humble about what we do. And, it, and to accept that the things we don't know and just try and work with what we have 
and then discover something new. And I think yeah. the, the story of your scientific career is a great demonstration of how all those three things can, can not only lead to great scientific progress, but to a happy and jovial existence, which is very clear from many discussions we have. And, and, and that's one of the great things of the joy that I have always talking to you is the fact that we both end up smiling. And to me, that's the wonderful, wonderful thing. So thank I thank you. you very, very much for taking the time and patience. And I, I have enjoyed, as always, enjoy this tremendously. And I think, I think everyone, I hope everyone who listens to it will enjoy it as much as I have. So I thank you very much, Andre. And thank you very much. I enjoyed it too. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a non-profit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.